this out to try. This way. Uh, no, for, for, for me. You know, wait, wait. Okay, now I've had shot. Okay. Look, over here. look to this one. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual HOA boot camp hosted by the Honorable Kelly Robinson, Commissioner for District 2. For the past four years, Commissioner Robinson has hosted this event to help equip citizens with the information and skills to make their neighborhoods safe, increase property value, and quality of living. With quality of living and safety in mind, our audience is participating via Zoom this year. We hope you find our program informative and helpful. With that said, I'd like to introduce our host, Commissioner Kelly Robinson. Thank you, Wendy. Good after, or good morning, Douglas County. I am Kelly Robinson, and I'm excited. Um, this is our this is our fifth annual H Way Boot Camp, and it, it's something that has been dear to my heart. Um, if you think about it, at the end of the day, the home is the heart of the community. It, it, it's not the buildings, it's not the fields, it's the home. We always have to be sensitive to that. And so when we talk about home ownership is what we're going to get into today. That's something that's very, very important because at the end of the day, that brings stability. It brings security to a community. And this is something that I've observed over time. And we're going to get into it with a conversation is that, well, how do I improve the quality of life? There's two parts. We do our part, which is do what you can't do as government. But secondly, you do your part, which is to have your own type of covenant when you live in your own home, um, how you're going to manage yourselves and, and, and sort of relate to one another. So I've got a chock full uh, event today that we're going to get into right now. Um, with that being said, um, I would like to, uh, we're going to do a, a few introductions here in just a minute, but I want, I want to give, give some background on where we are as a county. And I've been in office for four terms. This is my 13th year, and I, I have to always say it, this, this is that, that last dance. It's the last dance because I pretty much have accomplished all I need to accomplish. But I'm setting the tone for the future. Our financials are solid. Steady. We came through a lot last year. Pandemic, the things that we went through, but it was one of those like, okay, let's, let's recalibrate this. We just recently um, um, set in fourth motion a new leadership team. That was important. So we got the money right, now we got the people right. That's important. And I'm giving you this as background because that, I mean, it's, it's just not about the shiny objects. I mean, at the end of the day, it's always, always all people. About you, the citizens. And so I use it just as a moment to give you a real quick insight in what we're really up to as a board of commissioners. I've got to thank the full board of commissioners for, for being here. I, I've got to thank my, my, my dear colleague, Commissioner um, Henry Mitchell III from the first district. There's nothing I can do without him. Um, he's just that guy. And I appreciate his support for being here. Um, and again, uh, Madam Chris, uh, Madam Trinia Carthen, Madam Chair, and of course, Ann Jones Guider as my colleague across in the West. They're all important, the five of us, in leading this county toward the future. Um, in addition, I've got some things we want to give you further updates. I've got some colleagues that are coming a little bit later to give you an update on sort of our spots and some of the key things that we, we're doing in the community by way of vision. But I just want to come back to one more thing when you talk about where we are. Why did I do this boot camp? One of the things is that this boot camp allow, I mean, allows is what we want to call um, conversation. You know, I'm very big on listening posts. You know, somebody made, I made, I heard a comment from a public citizen says, okay, well, how many town halls can you have? It's not enough. If I got 35,000 citizens, I could never get through them in my entire life. So it's all about being out there in the public, engaging the citizens. So I have these events so I can, I can galvanize the citizens to talk about things that are important to them, not me getting up there talking heads and look at me, look at me, look at me. It's like, okay, what's going on with you? Out of my HOAs, out of my townhomes, has come the need for us to create community centers, fire stations on Thornton Road, right? Our bus system, getting rid of those pipe farms in your communities and stuff that was very, very important. It was out of these type of forms. 
it's about listening to the citizens. I mean, it's not about government. And I'm always quick to make sure that our, our staff understands you've got a balance between, it's not just about you, you only exist because of the citizens. So we've got to be um, sensitive to that. So I'm not going to go long today. Again, we've got a, a very, very good event here. Um, again, this is our fifth annual. My name is Kelly Robinson. But now I'm going to bring Miss um, Legron up. She's going to be our, our moderator for our very first panel. And I'm going to give some background on why this happened. Um, uh, one of those things, I was on my way to basically Washington, D.C. And I was going up there for a NACO conference and National Association of County Officials. And my purpose of going up there is because Larry Johnson, the commissioner out of DeKalb County was being installed as president of NACO. That was important for the Georgia delegation to support. Two years ago, we went to Vegas to, uh, to get him um, elected, and now we watch him get sworn in. And with that, in addition, while I was up there, I made a, 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 an intentional purpose to meet with Congressman Scott's office. You know, I shared this story, I want to codify it again, that I was the first person to be in his office in 13 months. That's important. Uh, I was in Senator Office, Olsoff's office as well. I was the second person in his office since he came in. It's about being intentional. Sometimes it's about being aware of the moment. It's about you know calling that audible at the last week. I went up there for one purpose, but it's like, okay, where's Tiffany Stewart standing? Look, I need to, where's my aid? I need to get these guys' his office. So I'm always actively at work for my citizens. Like, okay, while they're asleep, I'm, I'm getting it down. I'm, I'm not public safety, but I, I, I count myself that somebody's gotta be on the wall. So I gotta be on the watch. And I appreciate that. So the first thing we're gonna talk about today is community policing. Um, it's obviously something that's important at the federal level, but also, but everything in politics starts what? Locally. So that being said, it's one of those like, okay, well, how do we deal with community policing? And I began to have a conversation with some of the citizens. I mean, I was in my listening post on Thornton Road, which I have pretty much almost once a week. But I'm always listening to the citizen. It's like, well, Commissioner Robinson, I've got some thoughts on that. I had a conversation with our sheriff. I was talking to him in his office about a budget process and what he was looking for. We got to this conversation about community policing. Right. I, I talked to our county administrator. I said, okay, what are your thoughts? I know you come from the city. I know you used to run a police um, squad in essence. So what are your thoughts? And as I got out there, I realized that people really were interested in what community policing was and how it can be affected in their community like of old. So we've got this conversation coming up right now. And so what I like to do, is I'm gonna go ahead and just yield the floor. Um, and Wendy, we're gonna go ahead and introduce everybody or yes, how are we gonna do this? Yes, I, okay. I will introduce them. And uh, good morning again, everyone. My name is Wendy Collins. I'm a legislative aide for District 2, and I'd like to introduce you to our community policing panel this morning. Uh, first, we have Mr. Ori Curry. Ori Curry is a retired veteran of the United States Army and City of Atlanta Police Department. He has received several awards and decorations while serving the military, including Legion of Merit and Bronze Star. In 2019, he and several other officers were awarded the 2018-2019 Atlanta Police Department Commendation for Clippers and Cops. Also in 2019, the Atlantic City Council recognized the team with a proclamation for their interaction and open dialogue with the community in barbershops. After retiring, he is still busy volunteering with a number of civic associations and nonprofit organizations. Oric is an alumnus of Leadership Douglas Class of 2019 and the HOA president of Villages of Brookmont in Douglasville. Next to Mr. Curry is our new county administrator, Sharon Subedan. Sharon D. Subedan serves as the county administrator for Douglas County Board of Commissioners, the highest appointed government official for Douglas County, Georgia. Recognized as a highly skilled manager and a dynamic senior executive, Ms. Subedan brings a proven track record of success in building effective teams, creating growth opportunities, and implementing fiscally responsible budgets. Ms. Subedan's career is in public service spans over 30 years with a wealth of knowledge and experience with Miami-Dade County, Florida, Montgomery County, Maryland, Hillsborough County, Tampa, Florida, and at Albany, Georgia. Her government leadership roles have been with budgets exceeding $4.4 billion, employee counts of more than 4,200, and populations up to 1.4 million residents with a record of achievement that shows groundbreaking and advancement of progressive improvement initiatives. 
We have our Solicitor General here, Ms. Sonia Compton. Sonia Compton graduated with a Juris Doctorate from John Marshall Law School. She is the managing attorney of the law firm of Sonia Compton, located in Douglasville, Georgia, where she specializes in general civil and criminal litigation, handling matters ranging from appeals, personal injury, criminal, family, and juvenile law. Sonia has extensive trial experience. She has experienced practicing law in the state and federal courts, and she has had over 100 trials and has mastered effective trial techniques that has made her a successful trial attorney. Joining us shortly will be Sheriff Pounds. Sheriff Pounds retired from Douglas County after serving his initial two years with the Douglasville Police Department and 38 years with the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. Shortly after taking office in January 2017, he adopted a new motto at the Sheriff's Office, progress is impossible without change. Since becoming Sheriff, he has implemented numerous changes within the Douglas County Sheriff's office to better serve the community. He created the SCOPE Division, which stands for the Sheriff's Community Outreach Programs and Education. Sheriff Pounds has also created a specialized patrol element called the Scorpion Unit with deputies who are seasoned officers who patrol high-risk areas and are proactively engaged in reducing crime. Right now with us is uh, Captain Elmer Horn, who is the scope division uh, head. So he will be uh, sharing with us about that until our sheriff um, arrives. And uh, last, but certainly not least, our moderator, Miss Melanie Legrone. Melanie Legrone is a former Detroit police officer and former Fulton County prosecutor turned criminal defense attorney. She is the owner and managing attorney of a criminal defense and immigration firm focused on defending black and brown males against the injustices of the criminal and immigration systems. Mel embraces the ideal of police strategies designed to help agencies promote effective crime reduction while building public trust and safeguarding officer well-being. She believes in modern policing and officers being the guardians of the city. This is our community policing panel. Ms. Legron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson, for the opportunity to moderate such an important topic, one that is near and dear to my heart. So before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we do have a hard stop at around 10 o'clock. Uh, so we do wanna make sure that all questions are able to be answered. Um, and of course, we don't wanna talk over each other. Uh, so we wanna be respectful of that. And for everyone that is on the Zoom, um, although you are muted, you are able to put your questions in the chat and we will be able to address uh, your questions here this morning. And then anyone that is in the room. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we will address you at that time. So my first question is for HOA President Curry. What would you say is the most significant factor driving crime in Douglas? I think one of the significant factors that, that drives crime in Douglas County is that sometimes people take opportunity to, um, in, in, well, I could say about our community. What we try to do inside of there is be proactive with law enforcement to make sure that, you know, things are going the way, having directed patrols inside the community, uh, also have, being able to engage with uh, the sheriff department. Now, our community is a little different because we kind of, um, in between with Douglas County and Douglasville. Uh, so we have to engage with both the police department as well as the sheriff's office. So I think what we try to do is do things that have our kids engage with uh, law enforcement versus, um, you know, them finding out later on that there was a big problem in our area. And it's just a neighborhood watch. We're one of the only uh, communities inside of uh, Douglas County that have a neighborhood watch program. Program. And that is very, very important uh, to keep, you know, the crime down in the neighborhood when they see law enforcement as well as the community engaged in activity that's going on inside the area. 
Thank you, President Curry. Um, definitely, I believe neighborhood watch programs in the community and the community engaging with the police is always helpful in reducing crime. So great insight. Um, Solicitor General Compton, in your opinion, what are the most effective strategies police and the community can adopt to reduce crime while respecting people's rights to fair and impartial treatment? Good morning. Uh one of the things that I think that we can do is, uh, that the police can do, number one, is engage with young people. And the reason I say that is, when I grew up in Valdosta, Georgia, we were always taught that the police are your friend. And when you grow up thinking that, you don't automatically see them as your enemy or someone there to hurt you, to harm you. So if police would engage with young people, even in school, we have police in school, but oftentimes it's kind of adversarial engage with the young people and then it builds from there. I think um, we have police officers that patrol areas, but they're in their cars. So people don't see them. They just see them drive by. Why not have them get out? Go out and talk with some of the people in the community. Talk with the young folks. Talk with the, the boys playing basketball. Engage with them. That would also, because um, once there's a rapport and there's some trust there, that would also help with solving crimes because I know I can trust officer such and such, so if he asks me about what happened, I can let him know. It's very important. It's bonding with the people, getting to know the people that you police. Thank you, Solicitor Compton. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is one of the uh, goals of community policing is for the police to get out of their vehicles, bond with the community, get to know the neighbors, the neighbor's kids, and things like that. Captain Horn. When we say community policing, there is sometimes a misconception of that title. Um, can you explain to the audience what do we mean by community policing? Well, um, when you talk about community policing, um, you know, the, the first thought process most folks think of is, great, they're coming into our community to police us to make sure we're doing the right thing. And it's usually a negative sense, but that's not it at all. It's a complete reverse or a 180 from that. Um, when Sheriff Pounds took office in 2017, um, I was in training at the time, and uh, he promoted me up to, uh, I was a lieutenant, and he moved me up to the, what we call the fourth floor to start his, uh, what we call the scope division, which is the Sheriff's Community Outreach Programs and Education. And that's our form of community policing. Um, and what we do is uh, we're not policing communities. We are going out and involving ourselves in communities. Uh, we have an ice cream truck that we've purchased with drug funds um, that we go out into neighborhoods. Uh, if you have an event in your neighborhood, uh, like a block party or your HOR parties where you're having your neighborhood parties, uh, and get-togethers, we'll come out with you. Uh, we have a sound truck that uh, we have purchased as well that comes out, and um, we really just kind of bring um, what I call the entertainment uh, to the to the subdivision, so that the the kids and the uh, community people and the citizens can see all law enforcement officers in a whole different light. That they see us as as people and humans that are out here wanting to help them. Um, you know, shortly after him taking office, uh, we went to uh, several neighborhoods in the county uh, and done foot patrol, where we went door to door, knocked on doors, and said, uh, you know. For example, with, my name's Captain Horn. I'm with the Sheriff's Office today. What can we do? What would you like to see or what can we do to help you with your community? It's your community. You live in that community. We can't be there every single time or every single second of the day. That would be a perfect world. But it's not, unfortunately, that way. So we're out there and asking, what can we do uh, to help you uh, with your community? If you're seeing something that uh, we can do to, to make it better or you may have a question, why, you know, why have you got a deputy down here all the time uh, watching these stop signs uh, or, or something of that nature? I mean, most times we get complaints on people on stop signs. Um, with kids in the area, that's important because if you have children out playing in your uh, subdivisions and they're playing with balls or whatever, it runs out in the street, somebody runs a stop sign, they're not keeping their speeds down like they need to and it could potential danger there. So those are things
things that we just educate the community on why we're doing what we're doing. It's not that we're wanting to revenate money or anything like that. That's a, that's a safety concern for your children that are playing in the, in the streets. And we usually get complaints is the reason we go out to these areas. So it's a, it's a big thing on bringing in law enforcement into your community to be that partner and uh, to kind of be like the big brother to come in and help you, whatever you need. Um, not so much the heavy hand that people think of when they think of community policing, like, oh, they're coming to watch us. One of the worst things that I can hear in public, and you all hear it, is when you have, you go into a restaurant and you have a family sitting there with a young child. And the first thing the parent tells them is, if you don't behave, he's gonna get you. I'll walk over and say, no, ma'am, that's not true. I'm your friend. I'm here to help you. Uh, I'm, I'm not here. Now, you know, we all know breaking the law is breaking the law, but it's not my purpose to take them if they're not behaving. They're, that's the parent's responsibility is to make sure that they behave. But it's not our job to that heavy hand we're there if they break the law but we're also there to be their friend and they need help to be there and uh, and help them so that's one of the most misconceptions i hear all the time it, it just hurts me because they're tainting that picture where we're not your friends like you 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 said we are we're here to help sometimes that that works that way but that's where sheriff pounds is at he's, he's got a heart as big as this building for his community and wanting to help him Great. Thank you, Captain Horn. Very insightful. And definitely, I believe that that is a huge factor, as you said, is making sure that your children are not scared of the police and don't threaten them with police officers taking them away and things like that. Because when they get older, then what happens? It's in the back of their mind, they think. And they want to run away from the police and then all kinds of issues, as we know, yes, occurs. Um, just piggybacking on that question, um, Captain Horn, just one more for you. What kinds of procedural and operational changes do you believe that Douglas County Police Departments need to make to further community policing? Um, some of the things that, you know, that... As a law enforcement officer, I, I was born and raised here in Douglas County, and I've been with Douglas County for 25 years. This is the only county, uh, our only police department or law enforcement that I've worked for um, through my career, and I worked for three sheriffs. And uh, and you see the different um, mindsets or the different visions that each sheriff brings when he comes into to office. And with Sheriff Pounds, you know, it's always we can do better. And, uh, and I think, you know, coming out and getting in the neighborhoods more um, with this pandemic that we've been faced with, unfortunately, sometimes it, we have to curl back some of the things that we have in our community involvement because of the pandemic, because we can't risk spreading this um, virus into our jail, our, our workers that are in our jailers and our deputies that are working in our jails, because we have a shift go down, then now we still have to watch inmates and guard inmates. So we have a, a big responsibility. So I said one of the things I th would like to see, I guess, for us to change is more manpower to put forth community policing uh, to where you can put more people out there in that community. Um, but with that comes money, comes budget, all those things come attached to it. And then you look at the hiring problems that we have in the, in the community, in, the, in law enforcement today, because nobody really wants to do this job anymore. Um, but, you know, the fact is, is we still have to have this job or we would have chaos and people wouldn't be safe in their homes and we couldn't help folks. So with that being said, you know, we have to be competitive with salaries. We have to be um, being able to hire good quality uh, applicants so that we can have folks that, that have a heart for caring and get out and help with our communities and do that stuff. So that's one of the things I think is, you know, being able to have the manpower to get out and do these things that we need to do in our communities. And that's a huge task. Great. Thank you, Captain Horn. County Administrator Subedan. In your opinion, how do we rebuild trust between the police and the community? Well, thank you for the question, Melanie, and, and thank you all for allowing me to be here with this very distinguished panel. Um, you know, trust is that is that intangible, right? And um, you don't wait for a crisis to occur to start to build trust. 
call it building the trust on the blue sky days. And community policing is not an event, it's a culture. As, um, as, our, as my esteemed panelists said, it is building that trust with young people when they're still impressionable, when they're still young when they're still open to, to learning, their, their hearts are open, their minds are open. And so um, one thing that I would like to, to sort of um, highlight is the importance of crisis intervention training. Um, in my opinion and experience, that is one area where we can help to build trust because we make sure that our officers have the tools to be able to deal with challenges in the community. Um, in my experience, a lot of what comes to a conflict in communities is dealing with individuals who have mental health challenges. And um, over my career, I've seen where that has really exploded. And I can only imagine, good morning, Sheriff, what is happening in the jail right now with people with mental health challenges. You know, when officers go out, they don't really necessarily know what they're facing. And the tools, the education, the experience to deal with those challenges helps build trust. Because when an officer goes out and they're trained they, they know how to talk down and de-escalate a situation. Everybody's watching, you know, the cell phone cameras are going, you know, and, and as they are able to bring down the, the heat of a situation, others look at that and say, that's somebody I respect. They have a skill, they have a skill that I don't have. Thank you, County Administrator Subedan. That was a very, very insightful answer. and. You mentioned about mental health, mm -hmm. and as we all know, that is something that is very prevalent, um, and we do need to figure out how to assist the police officers in dealing with, um, you know, citizens that do have mental health that might, they might not know it. Um, so one of the things that I've even seen with community policing is when you have police officers in those neighborhoods, mm -hmm. they know mm -hmm. Johnny who has mental health issues mm -hmm. so that when something goes down, they automatically know that there's someone that they need to call versus that person being, you know, aggressive towards them because they want to harm them or something. So uh, definitely a, a very, very uh, great topic that needs to be explored more. Welcome, Sheriff Pound. Thank you very much for joining us. Great to be here. Great. So I am going to address the next question to you. Um, to be an effective law enforcement agency, to be, an, to be effective, law enforcement agencies must constantly adapt to the changing nature of crime and the way criminals behave. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing law enforcement today? Touched on a moment ago with uh, known health issues because, and the children. I start back in the beginning with our children. Our children are the ones really committing the crime. Kids is anywhere from 12 to 19 really committing the crimes here, I guess all over, but we got to go back, stop trying to be their friend and be a parent for number one. And this mental health challenges is uh you know, we come across that so often now until it's unreal. We used to never face that back when I started policing 45 years ago, but you're seeing it more and more. And for some unknown reason, a community is let us be the hospital. Jail is not the place for a person with mental issues. It's just not the place. We must come up with a place that will benefit these challenges that we have concerning our mental health patients. Because once they get there, they get on the medication, they act like normal people. And that's all they need in the beginning is someone to take basically better care then while he's not in jail. 
in this community policing. That's what we want folks to do, to see us doing something different and putting handcuffs on folks. So challenge today is our children and these health issues, no health issues. Great, thank you, Sheriff Pound. And just to elaborate a little bit on that, is there any processes or procedures in Douglas County where the police have a relationship with mental health professionals, anyone that they can call or anything like that when a situation arises? We are right smack in the middle of coming up with a program right now. And everybody on board, commissioners, the uh, DA, judges, everybody's on board because we know it's a growing problem and we must fix it. So if I ask this question probably two months from now, I'll give you a great answer. But we're all in process of making that happen as you and I speak. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Thank you. HOA President Curry, in your opinion, how do we build a level of engagement or more engagement between the police and the community that they serve? I think more engagement should be like like we all talked about is the community involvement, meaning that um, that most people um, residents should look to law enforcement as one option, but we also should be a community and we should police in a side our own community. And I think that's one thing that we always like um, Sheriff Pound said, we look to law enforcement, but sometimes we should look within. And I think looking within, we find out, okay, who's in the community that has mental illness, okay? And how can we help that person inside the community? Also, if we know that, you know, little Johnny or a kid is, you know, being mischief, we should, we should engage with that. And, and he said it clearly, we as parents uh, or grandparents need to be more active in a child's, in the child's growing, their health issues and things of that nature. We put all that now, most time frame I see is we put it on either the teachers or law enforcement. And, and the parent does not sometimes want to have responsibility uh, for what actions that the children or the child does and which leads up to where you have later on, the adult becomes a product of the system. And so if you can keep them out of the system, that would be that would be more than helpful. But when you have that engagement inside of the community, that is very important where we look to law enforcement as one avenue. But we also need to look at, you know, our public officials and we also should look at our health care because health care is very important. And how we get that before they get to you to the to the to the to the, to the process of that and before they get to the DA's office where they got to go in and figure all this out and say, OK, this person had a mental illness. So I think that is one thing that we definitely need to um, look at with inside the community. And what we try to do inside our community is have social events. But since the pandemic, that kind of pushed away, but we still do Zoom, we still do things of that nature, trying to find out. We have a neighborhood watch program. We also uh, are trying to get back. We have outdoor events. So that is things that you have to have. And then people will come out and have more perception of talking to some of the board members about things that's going on. So we can kind of alleviate, and we only use law enforcement when actually needed. Thank you. Thank you, HOA President Curry. Uh, and just to piggyback on that, and anyone on the panel can answer this, um, are there any sort of programs or meetings uh, to where the citizens can actually come out and speak with you and you can address the things that we talked about today as far as them teaching their children, you know, not obviously telling them how to teach their children or how to parent, but to let them know the things maybe that they should and should not do when it comes to you know, talking to them about the police. Do we have any sort of programs like that? The chief and I have a, what we call chat with the sheriff and the chief. We actually go to these barbershop, these beauty shops. We actually invite our community there for the same thing. Speaking of, they ask questions about what's going on here and what's going on there and talk about our neighborhood watch. And uh, then there's another one we call, uh, we do the guests, called uh, Youth Against Violence. Now that 
Some of it is being court ordered now because of the children, but some of it is still volunteer. You can come if you so desire. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's so sad. When we have these programs and we put it out on the internet, put it on Facebook, and make flyers and put them out, you get very few parents that attend those meetings because we need the community opinion about things. We just, we just, your eyes and my eyes together here solve crime. If you're looking at something I can't see, but you know, that's another problem we have. They don't want to be involved, be honest with you. And we got to figure out a way to get them involved. So like you said earlier, they got to trust the police. Well, they're going to have to call us sooner or later anyway. Well, they trust that they don't when something happens. They're going to call us anyway. So we want that trust there. And uh, we put on the program just for that call that you just said. Because I want the community to know exactly what we do on a daily day basis, even the children. If you get the kids report, you got to make Because they they're going to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm a little bitter one. Then I'm old one. They'll start lying. But I'm a little bit of kids. They're going to tell you the truth. <laughs> And don't even know they tell him. Johnny selling dope down there. <laughs> they, they just tell him. Great. Thank you, Sheriff Pam. And this is for anyone on the panel. This was actually a question from one of uh, the citizens. How can citizens advocate for community policing in their neighborhood? We got the flyer. We're going to call. It's a certain thing that you figure out. I don't know. You have one of them? And uh, we leave it with the parents, what kind of problem they have, what kind of problem they got in the neighborhood. And uh, once again, always, I never close that sheriff door, standing over now, imagine, because I want the parents to come, sit down, and us as a community come up with a solution to fix the problem. I tell my guys all the time, don't bring me a problem that you got some kind of idea how we going to make us solution for it. So it's all about getting the community involved. And I'm just, you boil a lot of it, but when you don't get to the bottom of it, that's what's going to come to. I would like to address that as well. Okay. The sheriff made a good point. They're having these conversations. They're having these get together. If you want community police and if you're interested in attend, talk with them. That is your opportunity to let them know, hey, in our neighborhood, we have this issue. We would like for you to come over. We would like for you to do these things. But if you sit at home and you don't participate, this is what you get. So go to these meetings. Call, reach out to them. As he says, doors open all the time. I mean, sometimes not when I want to eat over at the sheriff department. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're, they're 24 hours and he's available and they're available. So that is how you reach out and get the community policing. One last thing on that, because I got to get a nugget in just a very few minutes. Matter of fact, I got to leave after this. I develop a unit when I take over that office, and it's called the Scorpion Unit. That's my outreach program. That's what we got the ice cream truck, the hot dog, I mean, the grill. We go out and cook hot dogs, and they stay every day. They don't do the answering house calls. They stay in them each community every day, waving at everybody, letting them know who they are. They got called to get the folks and just try to get them involved in the community. And they had this big old gathering just for our community. We furnished the hot dog, we furnished the hamburgers, and we furnished the ice cream. Now that turned out been yeah. fairly decent. <laughs> but that's Captain Horn over there, and he didn't want to run that outreach unit. So we just got to do more of it. Like you said, if you call and say, we want you to bring the truck in the grip, we're there on the spot every time we're there because we want that bridge the gap between us. We want us to be where if they see a crime, you know, like you see this stuff that they're messing up law enforcement, everybody hate law enforcement, they ain't about nothing. But if you got that trust in the community with your thing, you won't have that problem because they know I hold my folk little feet to the fire. If you do something, you got no business, I can't look over it. I got to deal with you, and I do that. And that's what I've been doing for the last five years. And I will continue to do that. Now, Henry, I don't know about you, but I must go. I got to know you though. Know, <laughs> Thank you, Sheriff Tom, for uh, your presence here today. <laughs> <laughs> and for everyone on the Zoom, for everyone here in the audience with us, 
you have to get out there. You have to participate. You have to want this for your community. And, and of course, when there's food involved, more people do attend. But. Always, but also, you know, any of your HOA meetings that you want us to come and be a part of, uh, give me a call. Uh, we'll send it, either myself or, or other deputies of my, of my division. will come out and attend your HOA meetings and answer any of your questions that you have. Uh, we, we welcome those because that gets us back into those communities and those neighborhoods and let you know what we can do. And that gives us vital information on what we can do to help y'all. And uh, all you have to do is reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to come out and, and do what we need to. And, and I want to caveat off that. He is correct because that's what we do over at the Villages of Brookmont. We actually have had events yes. with, the, with both the sheriff and the police department. And I guess because I'm prior law enforcement, that's, you know, makes me a little different than most HOA presidents because, you know, I, I understand community orientating policing. I understand crisis intervention training because I was a trainer trainer for all of those as being an instructor. So, you know, that is one thing that we sit down ahead. And like I said, right before the pandemic, we actually were setting up a summit with all the HOA presidents that were in the area so we can handle certain things and have the law enforcement there and see how we can engage that. So, but we have to be the forefront of that. So that's why we ended up, and you know, I didn't know it till later on that we were the only, you know, HOA in the, that has a neighborhood watch program in the county. And you got all these other uh, communities that look, but they don't, they, they're not participating. He said it right. When we have functions like that, we want the people to be engaged. We want the community to be engaged. It's not only just to come home from work and say, oh, I'm done. You still have that community that you still have to be a part of. You still have to be abreast with. And that's one thing that we try to instill in our residents because we get new residents all the time. They change out, they come in. So we want them to understand the situation of what we got going on how this community is, and we want to we want to have fun, play, and enjoy our families and be in a safe space when we do it. So, you know, we want to thank the, the sheriff's office for always being there because, you know, I have direct contact. I just pick a phone call and somebody will get back with me within, you know, a, you know, a couple of hours or one of my board members on issues that we have. And not only issues, just being engaged and having events there. Thank you, President Curry. And this one, I guess this question is just to kind of piggyback on what we've we've spoken about as a whole. Um, Captain Horn, you had mentioned earlier about needing more police officers and budget for that and um, being able to hire police, because right now no one wants to be a police officer. Correct. How? And this can be anyone on the panel. How do we make this happen? How do we, one show people that policing is a good thing and to get the budget and everything that we need to build a bigger force to be able to implement this more into the communities. Something. <laughs> you know, for better or for worse, I'm the day-to-day -day operator for the Board of Commissioners, so I get to deal with the money. <laughs> um, and in my experience, you know, it is it's important to make sure that all of our county employees are appropriately compensated, but especially in law enforcement where they have a very difficult job. But I would also say that the law enforcement shortage is everywhere. It's not unique to Douglas County. Um, and the research shows us that throwing money at the problem is not necessarily the solution either. Um, so I think that, you know, we have to kind of step back and look at different approaches. You know, what is it that attracts a person to um, to a position and to a really to a lifestyle? Because law enforcement is not really just a job. No, it's not. You know, it, it's a lifestyle. Yes. And then there's some I think there's some practical things that can be done. Um, not to, you know, dwell on my my past, but one of the things that um, several law enforcement agencies have done is to create a non-sworn position inside of their ranks um, because not everybody really wants to carry a gun 
Um, sometimes people want to have that community services officer or that ambassador role in order to be able to take some of the burden off of law enforcement. So some of the um, non-lethal types of things, you know, I'm, I'm sure the officer will tell you, you get calls all the time for, you know, I saw a suspicious person in my neighborhood. You know, that's, that's not really a tangible thing, but you can send a community service officer, an ambassador to that kind of call. Um, funeral parades, traffic detail, those things that, and, and what I found in my experience is those positions were easier to fill we had better retention, and sometimes people got into it and realized, you know, I love this. I really want to be a police officer and so, or a sheriff deputy, and then they would take the next step. Others would get into it and say, you know what? I don't really want to carry a badge and a gun. I'm good getting on the Segway, rolling around in the neighborhood, showing up at the events. They wear a uniform. They drive a marked vehicle. They're less expensive to carry on the rolls and they're easier to fill. So sometimes we have to be a little bit more creative with our approach on how do we really address the policing issue? And the other thing, and, and this is suggesting this is not happening here, is how do we use technology as a force multiplier on our, our force? Because, you know, it's, they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. You know, how do we start to look at how we can employ force multipliers to be more effective? Thank you, County Administrator Stubidan. That was right on point. Great answer. Solicitor Compton? Yes. I have a question for um, Mr. Horn. I'm not sure your title, not Lieutenant anymore, your title, yeah. Captain. Captain Horn. Yes, <laughs> Um, do you all ever go to school events, like high school, middle school, and let them know about policing, what y'all do? Uh, I know you used to have a, like a junior police type of uh, program. Do you all still do that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and, and it's funny you even ask that because uh, that's one of the things that when uh, back many years ago when I was on patrol, um, because I was a Boy Scout and an Eagle Scout, um, they knew the Boy Scouts of America, Learning for Life, has a program called Explorers. And, uh, and they found out I was an Eagle Scout. They said, oh, you're an Eagle Scout? You're a Boy Scout? You handle this. We want you to start this. And, uh, and at the time, I really didn't have a whole lot of idea what Explorers was. So I went to did research and figuring it out. And it actually is a, uh, a really good program. Um, it becomes something that I'm really dear to my heart. I've been doing it for the past 20 years at the Sheriff's Office. And uh, the Explore program is for high school students that have graduated the eighth grade going into to high school, uh, 14 to 20 that are interested in law enforcement. We bring them in and uh, we work with, you know, it's through the Learning for Life. So we have a liability insurance policy through Learning for Life uh, for their pro events and things that we do. But uh, saying all that to say this is, is we do go out and reach out to the high schools and that's where we, we recruit. Um, is from the high schools of our explorers and, you know, those high school students that are interested in that. We bring them in, we train them, we show them what our job's about. We show them that it's not always what you see on TV about the car chases and the uh, high crime every night. You know, they, they film for months to get 30 minutes worth of segment. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, these are things that we, uh, we show them that this is what our job is really about where to start and then give them that dialogue and that, that interaction. And we actually go and compete in competitions where they're actually judged by other law enforcement uh, officials on how well they do those jobs. And uh, in those different competitions, we even go to Gatlinburg and it's a regional uh, conference that we go to and compete against um, other explore posts all over the uh, Southeast. And, uh, and we usually do pretty well. We are in the top 10 usually each year. And so uh, I'm very proud of that. Or, uh, group that we do and um, got several that we've hired from that uh, that have moved up into the ranks of uh, different parts of the sheriff's office and, uh, and different things that they want to do. Um, so those are one things, yes, we do do. Uh, as far as that, we also go to, you know, job fairs at colleges and, you know, things of that nature to try to, to do the recruiting um, and doing that. So, you know, speaking about hiring new people, 
uh, to get them to come into law enforcement. We have to look at the generation that's coming out as the workforce now. And doing that, you have to look, and, and I hate to use the word millennials um, because it gets thrown out all the time. But uh, this generation that is coming out is not um, the workforce that I was raised up as. Um, it's a completely different generation. And, and their whole ideals and, and vision and, and logic is a little different than mine. And so that's where we do have to think outside the box on what to do to attract them to come in. And what we're seeing uh, as a trend in law enforcement now is uh, we're used to when you would go to work with an agency such as me, uh, loyalty, you know, they're looking for that carrot. Like you said, what enticed them or what, what is that that's going to lure them into working for the sheriff's office at Douglas County? And, uh, and we call that the carrot. What, what carrot is being dangled for them to come to us? And, uh, and those are things that we have to be competitive with our neighboring counties in order for us to, to hire folks. Um, and, and I'll give an example. Cobb County Sheriff's Office, they're hiring people in drones. I mean, just, and, and they're not hiring any less standard than our standard. Um, but a jailer starting out at Douglas County can go to Cobb doing the same, very same job, no different in job task, and make $10,000, $15,000 more a year just in that same job. That's one of the carrots. Now, back when I was went into law enforcement, I knew I wasn't going to be rich. It wasn't the pay is the reason I've done it. Um, some of these younger folks now, they're looking at it as a career and not a lifestyle. And, uh, and so we have to look at those different things uh, and try to think outside the box. What can we do at Douglas County? Because we are limited in what we can do as far as pay and all that stuff for the budget. Um, not saying that, 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 you know, that our commissioners aren't doing everything they can for that. I'm, I'm just saying we are limited in what we can do. So we have to think outside that box. And we're open for all those ideas because we reach out to different agencies to find out what they're doing to lure people. They reach out to us. We have several agencies that have reached out to us in the past month asking us what we do. And uh, we've reached out to other agencies as well. So those are things that, you know, we, we've got to do something to, uh, to, lure, uh, to get these folks to come in and good quality candidates. Um, because right now, out of 100 applicants, we may hire six at the most mm -hmm. because of that, um, because, you know, it's just not luring um, the good, great quality applicants that we that we're looking for for Douglas County. Thank you, Captain Horn. And I think that is great what you and County Administrator Subedan said about thinking out the box. So for the immediate need, you know, we obviously need to think out the box and to get people in now. But for future, let's even say like 20, 30 years down the line, community policing would show the little ones that police are your friend and they would see how the police are coming into their neighborhoods and helping them and how they helped mom and dad and things like that to where possibly when they get to be 21, 22 and they grow up, now what do they wanna do? They wanna be the police. And that's what I remember because I was a police officer back in like 1994. And, <laughs> and I loved my job, um, but today, Exactly, like I wouldn't want to be on the force today just because of so many of the challenges. So we definitely have to think outside the box and figure out how to fix it. Are there any questions um, in the audience here from anyone? And then we'll check the Zoom and see if there's some questions online. I do wanna say this about the mental health. Uh, we are trying to put together a program right now uh, for our citizens that our officers, when they go out on calls and things of that nature, uh, there'll be a card on there that they can either call the sheriff's office and tell us that they have a mentally ill person that's in their home and kind of give us some details so that we can put it in our computer system. So that way, when we dispatch an officer, there'll be a flag that pops up to let us know this is what you have. And this is some of the things that key this person so that we know not what to do. Uh, this is part of that CT training um, for the crisis intervention. Uh, so that we can kind of have a heads up of what we're going into. So that way we know a little more. And, uh, and right now, if, until we get those in place, if you want to call the sheriff's office and let us know, uh, you can call uh, my, the scope division 
any of my guys will take that information from you. We can put it in our system. So that way, you know, your loved ones, your family that, you know, you're caretaking for, that you know, he's, they're on medication and they have to take their medication. That's the biggest thing we see in mental health is folks get off of their medicine. They quit taking for whatever reason. They stop taking that medicine like they're supposed to, and then they go into a crisis. Mm -hmm. And when they go into those crises, that's when we get involved because people get scared and they call us for help. And we have to go in and help that person in crisis. And uh, and knowing what we can go into helps tremendously. The more the more information, the more knowledge you have, the better off you are going into that. And that would help us greatly. I think another thing is we also got to ask for. I know. Um, some departments have police citizens academy mm -hmm. uh, where you actually come in and interact with mm -hmm. the uh, with the police department right. as citizens and you get to see and ride along yes. and, mm -hmm. and be able to do that. That's one thing that we did in Leadership Douglas was we rode along mm -hmm. with law enforcement. Right. We actually in there, we went to the fire department and saw how they operated as well. And it was a whole and 911 dispatch. So I'm I an experience. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that's one thing that most communities should or or um, the county should advocate more is having their citizens come to the police citizens academy that's within inside their jurisdictions, county, city, so that they will know how law enforcement responds, do things of that nature. In your, and I know that y'all have one. Uh, as well. So that we was do, one thing. We do we one twice a year up until this pandemic, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, we would do one twice a year, but I'll reiterate what the sheriff said. We put it out there on social media. We put it out there in the flyers, and then we have very little response from the public. And nobody wants to get involved because they have their own family lives to live. And then share the And once we perhaps get out of the pandemic, you know, quick plug, get your vaccine. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also the opportunity to to do a junior yes. police academy, where it's not as formal as the Explorer program, but you can bring middle schoolers in and and um, early high schoolers, ninth grade, to come in and kind of see behind the scenes because you made a great point earlier that we skipped over right. people this crime does not get solved in 45 minutes like it does on tv <laughs> you know the crime happens it gets prosecuted you know the whole the whole thing happens in 45 minutes on tv right yeah, that, that, yeah. you know that's not real life and so bringing young people in so that they can see kind of how it really works um, is often really helpful as well and, and that is a great point because the, the middle school age is kind of where very impressionable. Uh, very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And those are, you know, we are in the D.A.R.E. We do the D.A.R.E. program at the sheriff's office and we do a kids camp mm -hmm. uh, for fifth, sixth and seventh grade uh, every year with in conjunction with Villarica Police Department. And uh, so, you know, it was saying that more of the middle school thing, that would be a great idea. And that'd be something we look into and maybe doing a through seventh, eighth grade. Great, thank you. Great conversation, definitely. Wendy, did you have some questions from the Zoom? I'm going to jump into this. Yes, Commissioner <laughs> Robinson. All right. I'm going to I'm going to add this conversation. Very good. And obviously, I'm sitting here listening. And two things I want to bring out when you talk about the youth. About the, about the preschoolers, high school, you know, and in between. That's a process. That's 20, 30 years. At least 12 years to get them acclimated to that process, right? To, oh, that they're safe, they're safe. But crime and things happen today. Every day. Two weeks ago. So you're, what I'm hearing conversations about, the current generation, make sure they're prepared, that they're, they're trusting 20 years from now. But as you know, as the elected officials have to deal with, you know, supporting these budgets and stuff, I'm like, okay, but what about right now? And it's closing that gap, which is like, okay, that where the, where the, the distrust is not with the kids. You're going to build them properly. The issue is distrust of people who already are at that place where the community are not connected. How do we close that gap? In other words, the damage has been done. Let's be honest. Right. Right. The programming that you're occurring. While I appreciate with the sheriff and all those things we're going, I, I think there's some additional capacity that is needed because again, you have social media and everything that's putting a counter message out there. So it's your message versus that, and that the power of the media is, is, is overwhelming. 
I'm a law and order guy. Everybody knows I'm a law and order late at night and stuff. But you guys get it. That I'm hearing like, okay, I got to take you a little bit deeper. Like, okay, but well, what are you really saying? Right? In other words, I appreciate this. But what are you saying? Are you saying additional capacity? Are you saying that the HOAs, y'all got to step up? I mean, what is it that we're really saying? Because again, it sounds like we're all acknowledging that there is a gap, but and it's a good conversation. But you know, at some point, what, what, is there, uh, to your point, a more formalized um, understanding or covenant or connection between the community and, and our public safety that allows us to get to the place that y'all are really talking about? And it's just, I need to hear something a little bit deeper. So please, anybody. I, I think a lot of times, yeah, just be honest. People of color have always had a distrust of law enforcement based on based on history. And so how can we bring the communities that are people of color that because we are portrayed differently? We it's just keep it real because that's a lot of my constituents, a lot of people who are in my neighborhood say to me, hey, you know, we're we're the first one to be shown on TV. Mm -hmm. And so we look at law enforcement as another area where you have to say we always see the bad cops mm -hmm. when are we going to see the good cops who go out and, and the sheriffs that do the good things inside the community not the bad ones because that's what we look at the most that's what we see the most that's what about the citizens in the community who are doing the right thing in the community who are doing we always look at the ones who don't media like we said play a big role they can spin anything away they want to spend it. So how are we going to break that gap up from seeing that bad part of it? Have more judges like on TV showing the good things that they're doing, giving people the opportunity to say, hey, I know you made a mistake, but we're going to give you this second chance. And because we see so much of it in media, media plays a big role in how stuff is played out in all of our communities because, you know, we can see things one way but do we know what happened in the beginning that led to that and I think a lot of times you know I tell people in my, just like Sheriff Pound said if you're going to come with me a problem you need to also have a solution and and I say if you have a problem what's going on in your community you got to be active you got to come out of your house if you know somebody's selling dope on your corner don't sit in your house and let them sell because you're going to say oh why my property value going down why this is happening inside of that that is key so yes politicians are there but the people inside the community yes. handles that situation they the one who vote they the one who said you need to be responsible and I tell people all the time, stop voting and don't hold your politicians and yourself accountable mm -hmm. of what goes inside your community, because that is key. We always want to point fingers there. And you said it, um, we always want to look at somebody else. Mm -hmm. When are we going to start looking at ourselves and what do we contribute to the community that we live in so that, hey, I don't mind the police riding through. Hey, how you doing? OK, because we know we're doing the right thing. We don't have to worry about that. And so we can hold that. But we always want to say, hey, this person is supposed to be handling everything for us. No, they're not. You're supposed to be handling things inside of your community. And that's what I tell everybody that's inside my community. That is what you you got to do. you got to be able to do that. And then if you can't do that, don't complain. Mm -hmm. Don't complain. Mm -hmm. Just keeping it real. That's I, I sit on the board for the Boys and Girls Club. And uh, something I'm currently working with those, uh, some of those uh, youth counselors and things of that nature. Again, we're going to hit the high school kids, but I'm going to start opening this up to anyone who wants to do it. And, uh, and, and kind of putting the elephant in the room, just like you said, um, people of color feel threatened by law enforcement because of one, what the media has portrayed, and two, maybe an experience they had years ago with law enforcement, whatever the reason. Uh, is a kind of a, a just a conversation or a knowledge sharing uh, meeting mm -hmm. where they're going to have kind of similar to what we're doing right now. The youth will come in or the, the public, if they want to call me, we'll set this up. I'll have officers of different race and gender come in and they can ask us the questions, the hard questions. <clears throat> we're not going to get upset. We're not going to get offended. You know, we're going to ask y'all questions of different questions of, you know, why do you feel this way? What, what does the, the officer do that triggers this or that? And then we, you can, we can tell y'all what 
triggers us on why we react certain ways as law enforcement officers. So that way we get a general understanding of why things happen the way they do on traffic stops or uh, law enforcement encounters. You know, when we patrol neighborhoods, if you stick your hand up and wave, our deputies will wave back. If you, should, you stop them, they'll stop and talk to you. Um, you know, they, they don't have a problem with that. They, they like that because one, I get to know who you are as a person. And then I know you live there. And then I know then if I'm at your neighbor's house and they're having issues, I can ask you, is this always going on or something? I can kind of get information that can help you in your community. And so it's just a, a general dialogue between the law enforcement officer and the citizens. And, you know, we're, and we're open. If you want to have those call us, we'll come in. Like I said, I'll set the panel uh, of different gender and race officers where they can tell you their experience. And it won't be ranking officers. It'll be road officers that are actually out there on the street, working the streets. They can tell you what they're facing, what they're seeing. And they all can ask the questions of anybody. The citizens want to come to ask the questions of, you know, the hard questions of, you know, why, why does it seem that way? And with the media, if they can get your emotions involved in whatever they're showing, their ratings go up because you're going to continue to watch. And that's exactly what it is. It's all about money. Right. Yeah. Captain. I'm going to add one like more to, to that. It. Let me add one more to that, please. Okay. Before we shift and, and, and listen, I was going to bring this directly to you. Um, which is, it's a difference between prevention and intervention. Right? Uh, prevention are the programs, social programs that we're talking about uh, that, that can sort of on the front end and do the education and parenting. But there's that intervention component. And um, you, you have a very, very important role, you and, and Madam DA, U.S. Solicitor General. Of, of, of how, how do we make that determination? How do we, we still, we have those moments where, okay, it's already happened moment of trust and how do we I mean, it, it can be the hard letter of the law or it's the spirit talk to me about i know you've just come into the office i really want to hear your opinion on how we do that because there is perception in douglas county let's let's be honest there's two views and some i'm good i'm neutral with police and then it's our deputies or it's the other side of the fence and so i got to give voice to both sides so in your mind how do we deal with that prevent what, what can we do from an intervention perspective uh when, once you got beyond uh, something fell apart what, what what do you say what, because you you're the prosecutor so you got there's law enforcement they just okay i can bring you in but you what, what is your perspective i want to hear this okay. well the solicitor's office is also a part of law enforcement as well yes ma'am <laughs> What we do, um, I'm going to give you an example. Whenever we have a jury trial, one of the questions we ask potential jurors are, one of the questions is, have you ever had a bad experience with police officers? 95% of the people who raise their hand that say they have are African-Americans. Most of the time it has to do with traffic stops. Um, where they have been, they felt disrespected, treated rudely, uh, treated more harshly than they believe they, their white counterparts have been have been treated. That is what we have to deal with. This happens, which makes it often difficult for us to get convictions because they're automatically looking at the police. It's just we distrust what they say. That's just the reality that we have to deal with. Now, from our perspective, our office is about restorative justice. That, that's what we try to do. One of the things that I talk, one of the things that I focus on and stress in our office is that we must treat everybody, every citizen, defendant, or whatever your position, with respect. Because we handle low level, we handle low level crimes in the community, traffic offenses, misdemeanors. And oftentimes these people are just someone who did something dumb. They're not the bad, bad folks. Uh, our most serious crimes, of course, are DUI and domestic violence, which has soared during the pandemic, by the way. And of course, we have some vehicular homicide, which is an accident that occurred and someone died. And someone, uh, say, maybe weren't drunk or anything, just failed to maintain lane, hit somebody and killed them. So it's a low-level misdemeanor offense, even though someone died. So that's one of the things we deal with. I had a, a lady come in, her son got in trouble. He's a student over at West Georgia, the RA in the, in the dorm. So uh, he, he's a responsible young man, but he did something like trying to outrun the police one time. He's gonna get a ticket. Wasn't drunk, anything like that. Just did something, what I say is stupid. And his mama said stupid. <laughs> but he came in and, um, 
afterwards, the lady came to me and she said, I just want to thank you. Everyone uh, in your office that dealt with us, the assistant solicitors, they were so nice and so respectful. And she said, because he did a dumb thing and he had to pay for it. He, he, there were consequences. But that's a different side that a lot of people, when they come in, they expect us, the prosecutors, to be rude, harsh, not understanding. And we're giving this other side, yeah, you, there will be consequences now, but we can do it with a smile. <laughs> we can do it with a smile. And that's the other side of law enforcement that most people don't see. Um, they see the police snatching folks out the car, tasing them, beating them up and all that, which sometimes should not happen. And if I see something that in, in a video that I think is inappropriate, I call Sheer Pounds, he handles it. So I will say we do have that support from him. The community has that support that he will not uh, tolerate mistreatment of citizens in this county. I will say that. As he said, he holds our feet to the fire. Yes, he does. <laughs> Solicitor Compton, and you touched on a very important point, respect. Yes. And it seems that the respect is lost. It's lost from the citizens to the police and from the police to the citizens. And that's what we need to get back. I think we have a question in the audience. And um, one of the things from coming from Florida to here, it's an island here because um, I used to deal with the crisis in dementia here in Bay Area, where whenever we had a break, um, they would call them. They would come in, police officer with the intervention, um, um, and um, two hours, three hours later, he would get into the vehicle. Stay there with them until we got to the subject. Come to Georgia. <laughs> so I am looking forward to a crisis intervention unit here to assist because it is not. Um, my son is no longer in Georgia. He has us a parent in the TV and he did a lot of shock. So it's never going to have in this area at this time. Um, and maybe this I feel is more safe because I understand that other people understand this situation. So that's my take on this. I definitely have to do the community crisis intervention unit here in Georgia because parents have no place to go. But um, two things when there's an issue, but you want to make sure your child knows. Because he doesn't need the cane. Um, um, for that. Um, second point, a jail president, um, the trust perception. Um, we have kids that are misbehaving in our unit or in our, in our subdivision. I've never heard a two fold question from a parent that's a little shy about calling the police. How will you handle it? So it leaves me torn. How do you do? What do you do? Because this is not my child. But I'm bringing in officers that I don't know how to do that. Now, I'm a nurse first. I used to work with police department as a nurse. So I understand some of the um, um, programs that they used to they have that a parent can call to assist you when your child is doing something that you feel that he's going to have that. I've utilized it. I'm in Georgia, but I have utilized it for that. Um, so I'm now torn with if I call the police, how will this turn out? So I don't. I'm not going to do that. I tell them I'm going to call the police, but I won't. I need my heart. Because you want them to be safe and you want them to be addressed in a manner that's not appropriate. So as a regional president, I'm trying to do the right thing in the community. We definitely need to do a better job in perception. First of all, parents talk about trusting your children, but the parents have to trust your children. And you're exactly correct. In in Georgia, um, we are kind of uh, behind the curve uh, when it comes to mental health and having uh, resources and uh, budget 
uh, from the state and you know from the federal levels as well on uh, manpower of creating these crisis intervention teams um, because that takes money, that takes people, positions to create, um, and that that takes a whole nother ball of wax. But at the same time, it is very well needed because in today's times we are seeing more and more and more. And uh, part of some of the reasons I believe, as y'all remember, the state and the feds cut funding for mental health hospitals mm -hmm. in the state. And when they did that, they closed hospitals. And a lot of these people that were getting services in those hospitals are now on our streets. And now that's what we're dealing with in, 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 in Douglas County and in, in Georgia across the state. And, uh, and, and you're correct, we're, we're uh, kind of you're prepared to take care of that. And uh, we're trying to catch up to that. I can tell you at Douglas County that we do have uh, crisis intervention training for our deputies. And, uh, and also when our deputies are dealing with juveniles, um, we deal with them completely different uh, than we do an adult. Um, and also we deal with, you know, we have our officers, if you're having a specific issue, I was gonna also say that, you know, you can also call my division and we can have officers you can bring them to the office and we'll have officers talk to them and uh, we'll sit them and explain them to you know explain what the problem is what you know what the laws are what governs them and what's expected of them and uh and kind of give them those expectations and what what they have to do and don't have to do as far as them being citizens in the county as as your your, your children um, and it, hurt, it, it hurts my heart to hear you say that you wouldn't call the police about a juvenile that's going down the wrong path because you're afraid he would be shot. Um, that's, a, that's a huge problem for me because the last thing, um, and, you know, we're not perfect. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Douglas County Sheriff's Office is perfect because we're gonna, you're going to run across those officers. Every division has those that are, and I call them the jerk officers or the badge heavy officers. They're all there. When we find ours, we get rid of them. We weed those guys out, okay? Those are the ones that we try to, you know, and, and, and do the right thing. That's where Sheriff Pounds holds that feet to the fire. When you see that, we take care of those problems. Um, our officers are going to work with those children. They're not going to immediately just try to lock them up or take them to jail. They're going to try to help uh, you. The other flip coin of that is having resources in our county to help the troubled youth. Um, I believe our, our juvenile services, you know, could be better in Douglas County. Uh, and that's some of the things that we've, we've dealt with in the past is not having good resources for these parents to get a hold of in Douglas County to help with their troubled youth. And uh, that's where the youth against violence come from. Uh, you know, the other little programs that we've tried to stir up and start, but then again, Everything's, everything comes back down to money and budget on what you can afford and what you can't afford to do. And so those are things that we have to look at as a, a group, not just the sheriff's office or law enforcement as it, as it is a village, takes a village to raise a child. Uh, we have to look at it as a group, what we can do to help. And, uh, and to build that trust in your community is gonna take time. It's gonna take involvement from our part. Uh, I know you said Riverwalk, We've been down there a lot uh, and we welcome any time to go down and, and come out and be with your, your HOAs. And we've done the car shows we've done. I've actually come to a couple of HOA meetings with you. I mean, love those inter, uh, interactions uh, and then to be able to communicate with everybody. And it's going to take the time to let you know. And, and because that doesn't happen overnight, there, there's nothing I can tell you right this second. It's going to change your mind because actions speak louder than words and you're going to have to see it and you're going to have to just kind of gain that trust as we go. And, uh, and that's what I say from the sheriff's office and Sheriff Pound says the same thing. Give us that opportunity to show you what we're about uh, because he does hold our feet to that fire. And uh, so, and if you have a problem, you know, we'll take care of it because that's the last thing we want to see is someone get mistreated in our community uh, that should not happen. 
about mental health and as you know i've been advocating for mental health since 2015 um, before we, we began to do the dui all the accountability course because i knew it was a problem and when i first came in office i used to say well you know at that time it was chief judge james you know, they said, you know why, is, why is everybody getting 25 years in the box I had a problem with that. He says there's no alternative sentencing options. And so, okay, all right, we, we get it. And to your point, um, um, to, to the captain's point, um, I'm, I'm at a conference in Savannah and they were sitting up there saying, well, okay, that 30 year policy since 1984, when you came out of high school, uh, that policy has ran out. We now can no longer afford people to be in the system that long because now we got to pay for them when they come out. And so I said, oh, it's a monetary issue. It's not a uh, 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 a moral issue that you did this. And so, okay, stay with me, I know this. So, all right, and we know that um, in our, our law, law enforcement and detention center, roughly what, 20 to 25% of people in there are, have mental challenges. All right, let me where to put them. Let's keep it honest. All right, so we're trying to get resources here locally. So one of the things that we as a board of commissioners have supported um, is that we're, we're through our community service board um, and through some of the nonprofits and, and um, especially J Judge Bob McClain is to create um, an atmosphere in which you can access resources. And we, we put real money into it from a board of commissioners, but but that's just a, a, a little bit. I mean, we've increased our, our budget from, you know, 2% to around six percent regarding the public health and the things associated with that but it's a balancing act and at the end of the day you got ten dollars a need and we got one dollar the question is how do how do i now as i i'm listening to this come the budget starts in september 1st and the budget fiscal you know i do policy i mean i do um, budget um cycle and i've got to sit here and i'm listening to this conversation says okay but can we recalibrate it just a little bit what if we shift it a little bit Right, can it make us more optimal? Uh, we do have things that are out there as far as resources. We did put a guide out there uh, for the citizens who are who, who may not be know about that. We do have a a, a link, uh, this guide that allows you to get involved and um, look it up. But we need to do better in making that information available to you. There are resources out there, but are they are they being marshaled? I mean, you, you just have to know. You wouldn't know unless you had this conversation with me. And I hear us talking about we put posts out there and we'd be like, guys, that's not enough. Everybody don't live on Facebook. I mean, that, that's not the primary source of information. And so I, I have no problem with it. I have no problem with the freedom of the press. But I think to, 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 to um, um, Mr. Curry's um, um, a point, uh, there is got to be some responsibility within the community itself. They are going to have to step up. You, you can't be neutral. You know, you become anesthetized. You become critical. Whatever that thing is it's like oh gosh i gotta wake up you gotta get engaged government can only do what you can't do but it can't do everything that officer that, i mean I, I, so there's a real position says yeah i'll support something but only to the extent that you got to do your part to my citizens you've got to do your part you listen to them all that's why um Oric was um uh, we, we made named him uh, my first hoa of the year um um actual year uh, award recipient and the way he ran his hoa so I, uh, miss thompson i would I definitely encourage you to talk to him offline and, and and learn about that but there is a way that there it is has to be responsibility on both sides yes we have to care yes um uh, county administrator it is culture this culture, but culture within the actual HOAs and cultures within obviously our force. And it's how they come together, guys. They, in other words, we can coexist. It doesn't have to be these absolutes, but I'm looking forward to all of that where we can sort of move this forward. Um, I don't want to belabor this too much longer. Um, uh, to my moderator, any final questions we've got out there? How do you bring us home? Yes, we do have, I think, one more question. And I wanted to say thank you for the young lady in the audience for your question, because this is where it starts. Yes. You know, no one would know that if you didn't want to call the police at this conversation, and now you know what you can do in the future. So this is obviously where it begins. Um, I believe we have one last question from someone on Zoom. Yes. There was a statement, is there a public relations problem within the county and why are officers only dancing and playing ball with nothing else positive? Um, there's not a per se to me in my opinion a public relation problem um it's going to be with this pandemic in the last two years uh limited our involvement of getting out and doing that uh we do many many more things in the public than just play ball and dance those are the pictures that get caught and get put on uh, Facebook and, and different social media outlets um and, and I say it that way because sometimes it, it is that 
because if you see me dancing with the kids, it's going to be a, a, a comical experience. <laughs> uh, but it's fun. It's fun for me. It's fun for the kids. But at the same time, you don't see the officers that get out with the neighbors that are patrolling the area and just have a general conversation of, you know, what's going on in the, you know, the community and just how was their day or anything of that nature. Those are things that doesn't get caught on camera. And, uh, and those things happen behind the scenes all the time. And uh, it's not just something that, you know, we, we advocate to our officers. You know, you're not just there as the supreme ruler. You know, that's that's not our, our, our vision at the sheriff's office. We're there as public servants. We're there to help you and, and to be there and help that. Um, and a lot of times you see the officers playing basketball and different things of that nature with, with different uh, kids and things of that. Those are just getting our officers involved in what's going on with them. Um, you know, we, we, when we see an, uh, an opportunity, we take it. There may not be a camera there all the time to take a picture and show it. And uh, that's where, uh, like a gentleman here said, that, uh, you know, we don't ever see that on the media. A lot of times those pictures don't get made. And, you know, it just doesn't happen. I would like to say, we see a lot of people who get pulled over by police officers. We see it all the time because we prosecute those cases. And what people don't see is when the officer even has to arrest someone, how nice they are to the person that they have to arrest. Nobody sees that. You don't see that on, on social media. You don't see that on the news. You don't see that on Facebook or anything. We see it all the time. Yes, ma'am, I'm going to have to arrest you. Yes, call your mother, call your father, or whatever. You don't see that. You don't see that when they pull someone over who's having a, a, a mental, I'm not a, maybe a mental problem or a medical problem, and how they go in and help these people. That is what you don't see. We see it a lot. And these officers aren't going to brag on that stuff because that's not our, that's not what we do it for. We don't do it for the fame and the glory. We do it because it's our job. That's what we're here for. Uh, a motto, like I said, I was in training for five years and um, I'm a certified instructor in, in anything in law enforcement uh, that you can train, uh, have an instructor certification for, I have. And we teach our, our officers, our new officers, treat that person. And, you know, a lot of people would say, like, you want to be treated. That's not it. We go a step further. Treat that person like you'd want someone to treat your family. If that was your mother on that traffic stop, if that was your brother on that traffic stop, if that was your son on that traffic stop, how would you want that person treated? And that's what we tell our officers. Treat that person like you want to treat your family, like you want your family to be treated. And if you can't do that, then you maybe need to step back and let someone else handle the call. And so that's what we try to do until we can't do that any longer. Then, you know, and the citizen dictates that. I'm going to close with just this, this oh. comment, my, my final comment about putting things in perspective, all right, because again, we can have conversations, but sometimes, again, they, they can go left or right. Now, I want you to look at these statistics. In Douglas County, um, based on the census, we've got roughly around, let's just say, 140, 150,000 residents, somewhere around 146. All right, that means there's about 100,000 adults. Let's keep it there. Hundred thousand dollars on average in solicitor. Keep me right. Um, um, the solicitor, magistrate, they, you process about ten thousand cases a year. A little bit more. Right. But stay with me. I need easy math. <laughs> 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 this, 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 this is what ten percent. I mean, ten percent of the population uh, is going to get some type of. They go have to get a ticket, or they're going to get um, some type of misdemeanor. Let's keep it simple, 10%. <laughs> so that means that nine out of 10 are going to act right. Right? It's important. Felonies. Um, I know our Superior Court, they process about 2,000 a year, give or take. That means that out of 100 people, 98 are going to act right. Put it in perspective. Everybody's not evil. Everybody's not bad. Everything's not at the end of the world. So there's a bouncy access. It, it's just monitoring that. But think about it. But 60, well, 55 to 6 percent of my budget is what? Public safety. Right. So out of a hundred million dollar budget, I'm spending what 66 on this at my judges and my solicitors. Okay, almost 70 percent of our budget is just dealing with that. Dealing with that 10 percent and that two percent. So that's, that's bouncing. And what's left is for everything else. 
roads, you name it, right? But everything else. So it's important. So we're, we're balancing this. Okay, it's all about citizens. It's all about our behavior. And it's been, been recognizing it costs just for that, just to contain those issues. So at the end of the day, government can only do so much. But at the end of the day, I think there is a, a responsibility for creating your own life. America was built. Our founders, they got the great experiment, right? Like, look, you can, you can do your own. Like, we're not going to try to move up on you. We're not going to dictate to you. We're not going to be this big brother. We're going to be there to support you, preserve, and protect. But at the same point, you have a responsibility for your own quality of life and how you run it and how you work with your neighbors and y'all can all coexist. That being said, Madam Moderator, we need to get out and shift gears. Okay, so I guess we're wrapping it up. We're wrapping All right. it up. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, President Curry. Thank you, County Administrator. Thank you, Solicitor General. And thank you, Captain Horn. We're going to uh, take a brief pause. So our Zoom uh, friends that are out there, this is the time to go get your second cup of coffee. Do it quick, though. W stretch your legs. And we're going to reset for our um, updates, our county updates. So uh, uh, stay tuned.
Testing. We're live. Switch off the screen. Welcome back, Douglas County. Again, my name is Kelly Robinson, Vice Chair of the Board of Commissioners, and I welcome you to the second part of my fifth annual HOA boot camp. What a conversation we just had. Um, I really appreciate the presence of our sheriff and, and, and our, our, our captain from our public safety, our county administrator, Subedan, our solicitor, General Compton, and or current president of HOA um, of, of, of um, Brookmont, um, the villages. We are going to now shift gears. Uh, we're going to go into a second part, which is going to get into the HOA education, which a lot of you are here for. But before that we do that, we're going to do a little segue. I, I, I try to give an update every now and then about where do we stand. And, and, and so, again, coming into this, I guess I just started my, my, my fourth term. And uh, one of the things that was important for me and, and, and obviously working with Madam Chair and trying to help translate her vision um, into reality, which is like, how do we go to the next level? And part of that was to make sure that we engage the citizens and so on. But what are the priorities? It's one thing for staff to say this is what the priorities, enough for the citizens to engage us. I'm very big on listening. What the citizens, what's important to them? So anything we've ever done has always been involved, at least from my district, has always been involved engaging the citizens. And you guys know this from my perspective. So recently, though, we did a, a formal strategic planning process. And a new county administrator um, was involved in helping bring that to pass and helping align um, uh, comments from um, our citizenry, from staff, all over. And one of the things I wanted to just highlight really quickly is that, well, you guys know that for, for the past, what, 12 years, I've always at, engaged on, what do you think our, our party should be? We're gonna hit some of those highlights because some of those things are gonna come manifestation. But one of the key things I've always heard you say is that what was important was public safety, transportation, and economic development, and mental health. Those four things have been consistent things. So it was interesting when we just did a recent strategic prioritization process and had priorities, we engaged citizens. One of the key things out when we asked the entire county what they thought, public safety, you know, economic development, transportation. I'm talking about just the top priorities. So there was a consistent thing that, that, that lets you know, that at least from my perspective, that uh, in listening to the citizens, it was consistent. 
foundational priorities of the county. And so with that being said, is that as we now are going forward and now we're, we're thinking about, okay, for the next 25 years, we've got the strategic plan that will run us for the next three to five years. The question is, okay, but what is our biggest issue? Right now, Douglas County has aged out. We pretty much have um, aged out this route. Um, you know, in essence, we've got what, 30 year buildings, 30 year roads, how do we go to the next level? And obviously all of that um, requires money. Uh, we're having those conversations um, coming up soon and we'll get into that. But for the most part, what I like to always talk about is, but what have we done for you lately? What, 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 what is our number one thing? What is our biggest issue? So, and what have I done for you lately? I've got Mr. David Good is going to come and speak a little bit later. And I've got uh, Ms. Allison Duncan, who's also going to talk about something that's very important to me, which is like, okay, but at the end of the day, government has to have space to be able to do work. And uh, one of the key areas um, that is important to us when I went to Washington was to talk about transportation um, infrastructure and that Lee Road corridor is something that's become our east-west connector, our sub-arterial route. Um, hopefully, I um, county ministry, I can make it a state route and we can offset some things, but nonetheless, um, that, that would be my goal is to try to um, um, make that thing happen for us. But we, we know that when we talk about uh, traffic, uh, we know that density is always an issue for us, but it, it, it's important that, um, you know, again, we got to keep this county moving. It's about life, it's about mobility. So when I leave my house, I got to get out on the road. I got to experience my tax dollars. I got to get from here to there. I've got to have a, a certain quality of life. Now there is a role that we should play and we should deliver on that. So with that being said, I'm going to bring two special guests. So right now I'm going to stop with that because I'm going to come back right at the end and sort of bring this um, past. So Ms. Wendy, can you go ahead and introduce, please? And we'll just jump right in and give an update. Yes, Commissioner Robinson. First, we have uh, Allison Duncan, who is a senior planner uh, over in planning and zoning. She's going to talk about uh, the county master plan update. Allison? Great. Thank you. Um, if somebody could just tell me when my slides are showing to the audience. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, I am really glad uh, to be here with you today to present information on the Lee Road Master Plan. Thank you to Commissioner Robinson for creating this opportunity uh, to share information with the citizens of Douglas County. Uh, this is a small area master plan that was adopted as a part of the overall county comprehensive plan. Uh, the comprehensive plan guides growth and development in Douglas County. And the Lee Road Master Plan anticipates future growth along two principal county corridors. Uh, so that's gonna be Highway 92 and Lee Road. It contemplates the completion of the Lee Road extension that Commissioner Robinson had mentioned previously, and it recommends a balance of appropriate future land uses. So let's go on to the next slide here, please. So this plan sets out a vision. I get calls every day in my office from people who want to pitch an idea for development in Douglas County. And this is why plans are important because they reflect the adopted policy of Douglas County based on the vision of the citizens, right? So these plans are what allow me to confidently respond to these ideas and advise a potential developer as to whether their idea is going to fit with our vision. So let's go to the next slide, please. I'd like to take a minute and remind you of the existing conditions that inform this plan. Uh, I'm gonna acknowledge this was done the pandemic, and so we all know we've been through a lot um, since that time, but I believe there are some assumptions for this plan that are important to understand. Specifically, when we did this work a few years ago, we evaluated both the economic opportunities and the housing needs for the county at the time the plan was prepared. So let's go to the next slide and talk about that. The first thing I'm gonna share with you are the economic niche sectors, right? This is just a way that we describe the industry that Douglas County targets as a part of our overall economic development strategy. And this master plan identified things such as advanced manufacturing industry. Okay, so that's things that include food processing, medical device manufacturing. We looked at professional technology services. So that includes things like office support, data centers, fintech, and we looked at media and entertainment opportunities. This includes things like digital media, film and television production, retail, entertainment, and outdoor recreation opportunities. So let's go to the next slide, please. We wanna make sure that when we're considering all these industry opportunities, we're also considering the housing needs for future employees in these industries, 
right? So this plan contemplates that Douglas County will see growth in townhome and multifamily housing opportunities. And it also contemplates that the eastern portion of the county will continue to be the preferred location for higher intensity housing development with the greatest diversity of housing options. Okay, this means that it will also continue to be the destination for the greatest variety of shopping, restaurants, retail, and entertainment options for our citizens. So let's go to the next slide. When we looked at these existing conditions, I think it's important to remember that the vision for this area is based upon robust community engagement. I can look at data all day long, but it doesn't matter if that data doesn't align with the vision for what our citizens want to see for the community. So this plan made sure to capture what the citizens told us that Douglas County needed. Let's go to the next slide, please. Based on 289 responses to this plan, the vision for the area was crafted around the primary needs and priorities identified by the community. So these priorities identified those opportunities that citizens felt the county was lacking overall. We see that there's potential to address those needs in the community as I take those phone calls every day and developers pitch those ideas for what they want to propose in this area. Let's go to the next slide because I wanna drill down a little bit on some of what you guys told us you wanted to see in that area. 59% of respondents identified walkability as a priority. Right now we know in a lot of places in Douglas County, you just have to get in a car to go where you wanna go. Space for family oriented activities was identified as a major priority overall. Uh, development of a multi-use path system with connectivity to multiple destinations was also identified as a priority. Restaurants, retail, shopping, and gathering spaces are all desirable amenities. And as I had said previously, we do anticipate that the eastern side of the county will continue to be the destination for those types of amenities. And overall, the community told us to be certain that we reinforce that small town feel of Douglas County while providing more opportunities and amenities to those that we already enjoy. So let's go to the next slide, please. So this is the kind of vision when we do planning that gets people excited about how we can transform an underdeveloped area into a new town center. But let's talk a little bit about a couple of key things that we look at in the planning department based on the things that you told us we want to see. I mean, this is a great picture that you're looking at here on the screen, but I want to tell you what I see as a planner. We're going to be looking for a mix of different land uses coming into this area. So that means that we want to see housing, jobs, retail, and recreational space all coming into the area together. We want to look for a combination of not just roads, but roads, sidewalks, and multi-use paths coming in to connect this area to the greater Douglas County community. We want to look for connectivity to the Connect Douglas County transit system. We want to look for conservation of any of the environmentally sensitive areas that we might have. And we also want to look for defined architectural controls so that we're ensuring quality development that comes in with an overall unified architectural theme uh, for the area. Next slide, please. So to make sure that that happens, we also need to look a little bit further out than just one piece of this. We need to make sure that we're planning for supportive transitions in land use so that those new businesses will have employees to work in their stores and that those new stores will have customers to shop with them. But in doing so, we also wanna make sure that we're protecting the investments that people have made in their existing neighborhoods. And we wanna make sure that we're protecting the delicate environmental balance that we have in the area, which is why we don't just take one site, we take the entire corridor and break that into pieces. So to that end, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Right, so kind of starting up near the intersection uh, with Lee Road and Interstate 20. You might start to see a little bit more higher density housing and greater connectivity with Sweetwater Creek State Park. We know that's a tremendous asset that we have in Douglas County. We know that brings people uh, into our community every day. And so we think that there's opportunities kind of closer to the interstate where people are coming into our community to see higher intensity housing and greater connectivity to the park. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
We think that as you move down the corridor, you can also anticipate seeing more office and convenience retail opportunities, in addition to more infill housing development near the intersection of Lee Road and Factory Shoals. Now we're not talking about this as sort of a major destination or a major center. We're just saying that we know that there's some larger tracts of undeveloped land in this area, and that's gonna provide opportunity to infill those spaces with things that will serve the existing residents and blend with the architectural development that's already there. Next slide, please. So the most intensive future development is anticipated at the intersection of Lee Road and Highway 92. We've had some recent rezoning proposals that have come through that start to fill in that corridor, and we anticipate seeing more growth in this area in the future. Next slide, please. And then we anticipate, as you move away from this node, that we'll see more single family infill residential development tapering away from that intersection of Lee Road and Highway 92. Next slide, please. As we move out of District 2 and into District 3, we see opportunities for conservation subdevelopment and connectivity through Greenway Trail development. Next slide. And then finally, as we move towards Chapel Hill, uh, we see uh, the, the potential of the Lee Road extension forming that much needed east-west connection that will alleviate some of the existing uh, pressure on our county street network that we all are familiar <coughs> with. Uh, so let's go to the, to the closing slide here. I know that was a lot of information to run through. Uh, and to wrap up this piece, I just want to acknowledge that these plans are large in sweep and long in scope. Um, but I wanted to share with you a little bit of insight about how we make the incremental decisions every day to bring your vision to fruition. Um, all the information that I shared with you here today is on the county's website. Um, it's on the planning and zoning page. And I know that even though we can't be together in person today, there's one critical piece of information uh, that I'd like you to take away from this presentation, and that is to please make note of my contact information. Um, I wanna underscore what so many people have said before me, you know that my door is open and my phone is on, and I would encourage you to always feel free to, to reach out and ask any questions or sit down and have a conversation um, about any of this that interests you. Uh, and so in conclusion, I just wanna thank Commissioner Robinson again for this opportunity to share this, this piece uh, of information with you uh, and, to, and to, to bring this information to the citizens of Douglas County. So thank you. Thank you, Austin. Well done. Um, again, it, uh, the time that you spend with this, um, do you see this as something that can be realized in the next decade? Lee Road corridor. Do you, do you think, give context because sometimes citizens say, well, you've been talking about that for three, four, five years. How, how do we answer those questions? Uh, so the answer is yes, right? I mean, planning is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, you know, part of that is thinking that, you know, when change happens rapidly, that can be a little bit unsettling. So you can make plans and it does take a moment to, to, your order, to, to see them come to fruition. I do believe that Amazon, citizens will see infrastructure say, work beginning on are you happy Lee Road with your product? Um, happening Would you like this year. Um, our DOT has been working on right-of-way acquisitions, so I think you will start to see those road improvements, those sidewalk improvements, the multi-use paths starting to come out of the ground here along the road. Yes. Um, as I mentioned, we've had some rezoning activity um, at the intersection of Lee Road and Highway 92, um, and we've pending rezoning application for some additional housing um, on Lee Road that will be heard this month. So we are seeing um, some movement in this corridor based on those master plans. We're also seeing some, some movement in new residential development uh, on the Highway 92 corridor uh, between Douglasville and the intersection of Lee Road. So we're seeing some interest um, in more higher intensity development, which I know that sometimes density can be a thing um, that, that causes a, a little bit of concern for folks. But I think when you look at it from the perspective of, as I said, we need to make sure that we're bringing, you know, diners to eat in those restaurants and customers to shop in those stores, right? The kinds of, you know, retail and amenities that people want to see in the community also need the rooftops to service and support, you know, those businesses. So it's a balance uh, and we are always keeping our eye on what that balance is. And the reason we have those master plans is so that people can see on paper where we're anticipating these things to happen um, and understand where we try to guide growth and development in the, in the, in the county. Um, and I think if you look at what we've put on paper and where we are today, you see that within a 10 to 20 year life cycle, that's where we see these plans starting to come out of the ground. And a final question for you, and it's really just a thought for you to respond. If you think about um, developers coming into town, 
citizens have been cast and said, hey, this is what I want to see. But then developers come in there just like with homeowners, um, home builders, they drop something on the people and it's not what they expected. How do you, what is the role of planning and zoning to, um, um, what, what is your role to sort of ensure to try to balance the developer's capital and the citizens who uh, live here who vote? How, how do you balance that? I, I know you know the answer, so feel free to respond. What's so, your role? Well, so again, I think that we always try to have a robust public engagement process. Um, we would remind people that, that planning and zoning is a very open and transparent process. And zoning is one of those unique areas of state law that requires public hearings, right? And so I think very similar to some of what you heard during the community policing panel, you know, we will do our best to step up and do our job and get the word out, but we also want citizens to be engaged. We want people calling us, emailing us, asking us, you know, what's going on in their community when they see those zoning signs go up. Um, but more importantly, we want people to be engaging with us ahead of time and participating, you know, in our plan updates, participating in our comprehensive plan. Right now, we're doing some really exciting work in the Lithia Springs area, and we're doing some really exciting work along the Highway 166 corridor with the scenic byway designation. All of that information is on our website. All of those meetings are open to the public. Um, and I think just as you heard with the community policing panel, we just need folks to kind of show up and, and share their opinions. Um, so, so on that note, again, I would underscore the, the final slide that I shared with you. Please just take note of my contact information and, and call me on the telephone um, because that's, that's what I'm there to do is, is to answer the phone and answer your questions. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Wendy? All right, next we have... David Good. David Good is the um, SPLOS Communications Director, and he's here to give us an update on the SPLOS. And maybe, David, you could just start by telling us what is the SPLOS? Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, the SPLOS is a special purpose local option sales tax. Uh, the citizens of this county voted to actually have that done back in November of 2016 and went into 2017. And the first time the collection of April 2017. So, right, first, I would love to thank the citizens for, first of all, wanting to have a spot, second of all, to voting for the spot, and third, for participating in the spot, making sure that the vendors that we have, both local and outside of our county, got a chance to participate, and they have overwhelmingly uh, been able to be part of this class. Um, first of all, one of the things that we looked at when we go to this county is like the how much is that penny really worth? Our very first year of doing this for us, um, from starting April 2017 to March of 2018, the county brought in about $1.96 million just in that one year. Now, if you take it until now, if you go from uh, sometime about last year in um, July of last year until June of this year, we have actually spent over $2.5 million. So that is a big jump from the beginning. And in the last four months of collection, we have actually been over 2.5 to over 2.6 million, going as high as over 2.7 million. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get into the slides, please. It's very exciting news that's going on when it comes to what we're able to do with your sports dollars. Next slide. Okay, when you think of your spots, daughters, uh, one of the very first categories, of course, from earlier Commissioner Roberts talked about was public safety. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, we sometimes saw uh, before 2017 was police officers and uh, fire personnel could not talk to each other because of lack of uh, being able to communicate together. So therefore the county decided to use the first part of SPLOS money going into um, the fire department account in fire EMS is to build this public radio system. And so this uh, project is the largest project to date when it comes to expenditures. Uh, we have budgeted um, over 16 million. It came in um, in about 15 million. So therefore now we're are confident that our police officers, fire EMS, and anyone else can come into the county and be able to talk uh, to each other whenever an incident has happened. Um, next slide. Now, our new uh, county administrator, um, she actually, along with our chief, really is putting in that we need to uh, replenish our fleet. So this right here is one of our ladder trucks. Um, this is probably the most expensive piece of the equipment that we have bought. Um, it come in around about $1.2 million. And I believe this one is at uh, fire station number 10. And we have some more 
fire engines that's going to be on the block. So as our revenues are increasing, we're able to actually um, purchase more equipment for the uh, safety of our public and for our businesses. Uh, next slide, please. And that actually represents 32% of SPLOS. Uh, next up are our, basically our Parks and Rec. Um, Madam Student Dan, when she came in, one of her very first large projects that she was able to push and has made it even a better look is our new Dithia Springs Senior Center over there next to Fire Station Number One off of um, Grievous Lake Road, right next to um, South Sweetwater. Um, this project actually has two pickleball courts. Before I got involved in this, I had no idea what pickleball was. It was it was something when I heard it, I had. In my mind, I thought one thing when I saw it, it's a different thing. And if you go out there on those courts, those seniors will run you off the court, <laughs> especially the ladies. I mean, they will run you off the court. So this is uh, one project that we just had our grand opening um, last month. So it's a very, it's a beautiful, I mean, earlier this month, it's a beautiful addition to the community. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I'm not sure how many people go out there and actually play tennis, but also on this court, uh, pickleball, but this was dilapidated. No one could play on it. Uh, first, we were going to resurface it, but we saw that there was too many issues, so we ended up using SPLOS dollars in order to reform that and actually put more lighting and build out these uh, tennis courts. And as I mentioned earlier, pickleball, where they have drawn pickleball lines on these courts, so that's how popular it is in our county. And so both of these projects actually came out of the Parks and Rec Park that was 17% of this floss. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, when it comes to um, infrastructure, we know that anytime a county is going to increase their size, they want to give more to the public, infrastructure is a very important part. Um, for, so for about eight months, uh, we had Post Road Bridge over Dog River closed. And so, but I'm letting the citizens know now that bridge is finally open. On one side of the slide, you see it under construction. On the other side, you actually see it fully operational. So that was addition to the uh, west side of the community. So when you hop on Post Road, you have no problem going either way uh, on that road, north or south. Now, next slide, please. Now, Commissioner Guider, she is ex actually excited about this project because um, back in the uh, storm of 2009, which anybody lives in Douglas County know exactly what happened during that storm. Well, this uh, culvert, which is like a small bridge, was completely wiped out. Um, it stopped the community of Whitestone from growing because one side of the community could not get to the other side of the community and enjoy amenities. So recently, this uh, bridge was completed and is also open to the traffic. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Now, when you think about that last slide that we showed, that transportation equals out 51%. So you find out how important infrastructure is. But now that we've talked about some of those projects that are completed, let's go ahead and talk about some of the projects that are under development right now. We have the Boundary Waters Activity Center. Uh, one side, you see the rendering, the one's going to look like it's completed. And the other one, you see uh, as it is um, under construction. Uh, that building is fully, quote unquote, um, built out right now, so they're just doing some last punch list items. And so, once um, the fire marshal clears the building, then um, we'll get a um, certificate of occupancy and we'll be able to um, have that as a grand opening coming soon. And I pray that it, if there's anything like the grand opening that Madam Super Dam um, set up for the Lithia Springs Senior oh. Center, it's going to be grand. Mm -hmm. So, I really do appreciate the citizens for that because Commissioner Robinson will always bring up, hey, citizens have asked me, what are what is our spots going to do for us? Things that we can enjoy. We understand roads, we understand safety, but what is it going to be for us? What's going to be for our youth? What's going to be for our seniors? For these last two projects that we talked about, that's what we had in mind with the youth. So they have some place to actually play basketball. There's two courts in there. Uh, for those who love to walk and run, there's an indoor track above, and there's also a workout center, and it's two stories. So those are two beautiful things. And you can also have your family reunion. So if you're looking for a place to have a family reunion, that's the place to go to our uh, Boundary Waters Activity Center. And that is going to be the official name. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the inside basketball court. I actually was um, in the basketball court. I realized that being I was 48 really does hit your body. And, uh, I wasn't able to do some of the things I was able to do back in my youth. Dunking the basketball is no longer in my future. Yeah, next slide, please. Now, uh, we have... And one of the things that you notice that whenever you start working on projects, you find out that 
it costs a little bit more sometimes to do than you originally budgeted. Uh, we actually did a boundary waters uh, concession stand. That concession stand we saw ended up being a little bit more than what we had budgeted for, but we're still able to get it because our dollars were increasing when it came to our splots. And so this next one was that bill up in fair play. We actually put those out for bid together just so you get a better price coming in. Sometimes you have to be able to work with your community and your vendors to get the best options to get something. So the bill up concession stand and the fair play concession stands are going to be built out there. Those are two relative parks out there in District um, 3 for bill up and District two, uh, 4 for fair play. Next slide, please. And that's currently in construction. And now this is one of our feature projects um, for the business owners and then for anyone that lives out there in the Lithia Springs area, I live um, anywhere near Riverside and have businesses out there. We have this feature site for fire station number nine. Um, that's going to be a large part. This will be one of our largest projects that we're now working on to make sure that the businesses know that we'll have a fire station that's not only close to them, but actually has the vehicles and apparatuses to take care of their businesses. And God forbid that a fire comes in. So therefore, this one will actually have, you know, when we start out with four bays, we're going to see how our monies come in and see what all we can actually do with this building. But it will definitely will have an, at least an engine, a, um, a ladder truck, um, ambulance and other vehicles, even quick response vehicles. So this one is actually going to be on Douglas Hill Boulevard and Camp Creek Parkway at Thornton Road, depends on which side of the language you want to use. And this one is coming up. Uh, we actually um, received bids, I believe, um, it came back in on yesterday. So this you know, came back in on Thursday. So this is a project that is really near and dear to um, the commissioner, sorry, and to Madam uh, Administrator. Uh, next slide. This is just another angle of the same feature site for fire station number nine. Next slide, please. All right. And that is it for me. I'm willing to take on any questions. Thank you again, Wendy, for the great introduction. And thank you, citizens. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. So again, to the citizens, uh, again, this was just sort of highlight. You know, what are we working on and what have we done for you? And that's it's always about um, holding us accountable. I, I do appreciate public comment, uh, whether I agree with it or not, sometimes it's always important right? because you got to hear from the citizens and stuff. You got to hear their perspectives and, and like for every yes, somebody wants to know and for every no, somebody wants a yes. But nonetheless, it's about engagement. It's about stakeholders, it's about getting input. And so at the end of the day, we'll be, become a better place, uh, a, a better place because of the differences and the richness that, that exists because of the diversity. That being said, I, we're going to shift gears here in just a second to our final um, part um, dealing with our homeowner education. I want to acknowledge two things. Um, one, I'd like to acknowledge City Councilman Sam Davis that was here earlier. Uh, I want to make sure I acknowledge my peers as well as uh, LaShawn Bergdanley, also a City Councilman. We appreciate their presence here. We couldn't bring them on the show directly because of this was a program one, but nonetheless, we want to acknowledge for their support for being here and we appreciate our colleagues down at the city council um, and we're always there for you that being said we're going to take another what wendy five minute break to transition here short, short break don't yep. go anywhere zoom zoom citizens we'll be back uh, with our main event the hoa boot camp so stay tuned Oh, my, this is me. No, my, my sibling. Ah. Oof. I only did it because you're trying to see how you can get over daddy money. Well, let me tell you, don't let my bitch thank you up. I'm trying to tell you.
Thank you. This is the way. Mm -hmm. And I want to use my uh, military discount. Nita. Nita. And 
want to do a scan. Hold on. Reward. Yes, please. Oh, you know what? I'll say the difference. I want to add the protein in the bowl. The wheat. I forgot. Sheet for some reason. I was like, why? I'd like that? to welcome everyone back uh, that, and move into the HOA boot camp portion of our program. We are excited to have Commissioner Marvin Arrington with us for this part of the program. Marvin Arrington Jr. Esquire serves Fulton County as Commissioner of District 5, which encompasses Atlanta, East Point, South Fulton, and small parts of Union City and College Park. A native of Atlanta, Georgia, Mr. Arrington is a renowned super lawyer with over 20 years of litigation and judicial process. The son of Marvin Arrington Sr., retired Fulton County Superior Court Justice and former City of Atlanta Council President, and Marvin, um, excuse me, and Marilyn Arrington, a retired educator, Mr. Arrington adheres to a strong creed of community service and empowerment. Over the past decade, Mr. Arrington has created opportunities to provide education, entertainment, and empowerment to Georgia communities through his various entrepreneurial enterprises and civic initiatives. Commissioner Robinson, would you share some about Commissioner Arrington and your work together with HOAs? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this, this is the important part of the actual boot camp. Uh, it was, it was um, Commissioner Arrington who actually came up with this idea about five or six years ago. And he approached me and he approached um, our colleague, um, um, Commissioner Cupid, at least Cupid at that time, who was now the chair of Cobb County. And he had this idea of, out of, that was born out of his own experience about home ownership and what it means to be a resident. And, and some of the experiences that he was experiencing and the challenges and him being a lawyer looking at like, okay, this is not right. This is imbalance. There may be some misuses, some abuses here, whether there's a better path forward. And he came to me and he, and he began to share this with me. And I, I bought into it because like, I got it. And he was looking for partners to get out here and get the word out to educate the citizens. Because you guys know I'm, all, I'm an educator. It's all about the fundamentals. And a lot of times our citizens, they buy homes, they don't read the mortgage contract, they didn't read the covenant contract, and therefore, they're, but they're being bound by certain things, certain rights, certain experiences. So I don't want to get into his platform, but you asked the question as to why, and it's like, because it was so needed. This is our fifth annual. Um, it, it's always been successful because there's always new citizens coming into this. So I won't belabor it anymore. I just want to say I appreciate you, Commissioner Arrington, for being here, coming across the river, being here, man. So I'm going to turn this over with you and just let you go ahead and educate the people. Well, thank you, Kelly. Uh, certainly, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you uh, wow. and the residents of Douglas County uh, and the great panel that you've already had come forward so far. Uh, happy to be able to add... Uh, my, my two cents worth uh, to, the, to the topic. Um, basically, uh, what happens, you live in uh, those that people that live in uh, a HOA or a condo association, uh, which is called a COA, uh, or a property owners association, uh, which is the new thing, which is called a POA. Uh, these are covenant communities. Um, that is the one thing that binds them all together. They are community associations. So an HOA is one type, COA, POA uh, is another. There's also a mobile park association. Um, so various numerous types. And some of you may have even heard of co-op.
violation of protective covenants are the rules of the association. It's an agreement between you, the owner, the homeowner, and your association. And so it is the, the starting and virtually the end point for uh, you and your relationship with your HOA. The next document that's important is called the bylaws. The bylaws are the bylaws of the association. It's the rules of how the association will govern itself. When will meetings take place? How will elections take place? So the Declaration of Protective Covenants talks about the land and the use of the land and what you can do on the land. And the bylaws talks about the operation of the organization, the association. Now, 99% um, of the time, Commissioner Robinson, the association is going to be a Georgia nonprofit corporation. Uh, and so you also need to familiarize yourself with the Georgia Nonprofit Corporation Code. Uh, most HOAs, so let me, let me back that up. So if you are in a condo or condominium association, there is a condominium, the Georgia Condominium Act, which governs you and your relationship with uh, the association, in addition to your declaration bylaws and other rules and regulations of the association. Um, most HOAs are what they call common law HOAs. Basically, there's no Georgia law. There's no Georgia HOA law. There's no Georgia HOA act. So HOAs, as a result, are governed by the Georgia Nonprofit Corporation Code, which governs how all Georgia nonprofit corporations must govern themselves. Um, and the Georgia Property, uh, Real Property Act, uh, which talks about real estate uh, and the uses and how real estate is governed. Let me ask you a question. So, so to, the, to, to that point, Commissioner, you, 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 I'm listening to your, your opening comments. And so you've got, um, when I think about the HOA, and I listen to our citizens, they talk about the developer, who's typically the person who creates the HOA. Is that, is that a true statement? And, and then moving from the developer, it, it being turned over to the initial set of homeowners, um, and then they expand from there. Talk, talk to the citizens, help them understand that transition from the developer um, and then now it's taken over because some of the comments that I hear is sometimes that um, the developer didn't deliver what they were supposed to, whether it's pools, whether it's this, was that, or what happened to the money when it was transferred. And, and, and you sort of help frame that initial and then frame ongoing. Can you help them understand that? Because that's always a question I get. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm not a lawyer. So um, the developer is typically, like you say, what most people talk about, but it is the declarant, mm -hmm. the declarant however you want to pronounce it, uh, that is really the most important person. Um, it may or may not. So in, I was in the John Whelan subdivision, right? Yes. All right. And so everybody's thinking, okay, well, John Whelan is the developer, okay? And uh, for all practical purposes, he was. But the, the declarant or the declarant of our association was a company called JW Land Investments, LLC. Uh, and so it's important for you to know the difference between the developer and the declarant and the builder. They might, they could be one person or they could be three different people. And so, but the only person that has any real res responsibility to the association is the declarant because the declarant could hire a developer and hire a builder. And so you might spend all your time fighting with the wrong person. You might be fighting with the builder or the developer when you really need to find out who the declarant is because that is who you need to talk to. That is who is in charge. You know, I remember you brought me one of the, uh, uh, you're asking about transition from de developer or declarant to homeowners. I remember. Commissioner Robinson brought me a, a case where in, in 2014, he bought me a case, a uh, subdivision here in Douglas County, where the declarant's right to control the association expired in 2008. And the declarant was still in charge, still appointing board members. The homeowners 
were not in charge. The association had not been transferred as it should have through law. Uh, and so we had to uh, call for an election. Uh, so we immediately called for an election of the homeowners so that the homeowners could run their subdivision. Uh, and so it's very important there, sh there should and there needs to be transition. That's one of the rules. One of the things that Commissioner Robinson and Douglas County uh, have done for us and with us, uh, we're trying to adopt some statewide rules. There are over um, 2 million Georgians living in over 10,000 community associations and each has its own set of rules. There are over 10,000 different sets of rules for each individual HOA. And so we believe that there needs to be uniformity. Yeah. We believe that, believe that there needs to be transition uh, from homeowners, fr from the developer or declarant to the homeowners. And we leave, believe that there needs to be a state law and transparency. Give us all the records from the last three years. You shouldn't have to fight to get the records from the last three years so that you can properly plan for the next three years. Uh, and so transition is one of those areas. Uh, one of the things you wanna do in transition, you wanna get what is called a reserve study. If you are new to a board, new to your HOA board, uh, condominium association board, you wanna get a reserve study. Reserve study will tell you how much uh, money you need uh, to operate uh, on an ongoing basis, how much you will need for the next 20 years, which projects you will need um, uh, to, to prioritize and when to prioritize them. Does the street need paving? Um, does the clubhouse need a new roof? Um, and so it gives you a schedule for maintaining your assets. If you're on the board, the other thing you wanna do uh, is maintain, uh, make sure that there is insurance, make sure that there is uh, what they call DNO insurance, directors and officers insurance. Uh, and sometimes it's called ENO, errors and omissions. Uh, so I guess technically it is errors and omissions insurance for directors and officers. And if you are on a board, you want to make sure that they have that so that any mistakes that you make don't come back to you and your house. They are protected through the insurance policy covering um, any of those claims. So you want DNO or ENO insurance for you to protect, help protect you. And then you obviously want liability insurance to help protect any of the common areas uh, of your association. Um, most of these associations to Mr. Robinson are mandatory. Your membership is mandatory. By signing on to live in that subdivision, you are automatically a member. You don't have a choice and you have to pay your dues. Your dues go to cover the cost of maintenance and upkeep for common areas. But what if I don't, what if I don't pay my, my my, my, my dues. So what, what, what is the consequence of that? Because that's a conversation I, I get into quite often as well is the power of that HOA um, for non-compliance. So um, as an attorney, I would advise you to pay your dues. <laughs> here, here. Uh, pay your dues. And if you have a problem, then file suit for your problem. But do not make, do not not pay your HOA dues because that's only going to exacerbate your problem and it could lead to you losing your home. It could lead potentially to the association foreclosing on your home. It certainly will lead to attorney's fees and other costs being added to the amount of the dues that you owe. So at the very least, pay all your dues up front so then the association can't say anything thing against you or anything that you've done wrong. And it's just you expressing, you know, hey, there hasn't been an election in five years. I'm suing because I want to run for the board, right? I'm suing because the pool hasn't been open in five years. I paid my dues. So I'm entitled to access to the pool because if you don't pay your dues, then you're not even entitled to access. <laughs> So you have to pay your dues and then say, hey, I paid my dues. The pool's not open. The clubhouse isn't open. I can't use it. 
and you will be in a much better position going forward than if you do not pay your dues. Um, if you do not pay your dues, they will, you know, they're going to collect on you and they have the right to charge you for that collection. And then you have to go hire an attorney. So then now you're paying for your attorney and for their attorney. You're paying for both attorney fees if you do it that way by not not paying your dues. So pay your dues and then you can fight your fight and everyone will listen to you and likely pay more attention if you are in fact current on your dues. Um, that is, you know, pay your dues, pay your dues, pay your dues. <laughs> no matter what membership is mandatory. All right. So, so you hear that pay your dues. So let, let's extend that. So I heard you say they could, you know, fines it means liens, not even foreclose. Now I'm going to, I'm going to look at it this way. We asked you and I, we're fellow commissioners. We're just paying for a reason. I have to be certified. I have to have a certain amount of education and continuing education credits. In other words, I'm responsible for the taxation of the county. I can take your property, we can condemn, we can do a lot of things. There's a lot of power in being a commissioner. But it's regulated. It's certain behavior that, I, as I listen to some of the things that happen with these HOAs, like, oh, I'd be in jail for some of the behavior I see. Uh, it's overextension. It's like a misuse. And to, to Commissioner um, um, Erickson's point, it's unregulated. And that's my issue. And that's what we're talking here. And that's why this boot camp is so necessary to shed light. Like, okay, come on, guys, there's got to be a balance. We're all neighbors. We should be behaving and working well together. Yeah, if you got a, an issue, but, but, but there's, there's something about these elections that I have a problem with. They don't hold elections. Think about us. Think about what's going on right now. You're going to take them, you're not going to hold an election? Right. You're not going to show your, your, your expense accounts or your, your operating budget. That's a problem. So for those who are part of the HOAs, both residents and those who are running it, transparency is key. You cannot not do that. You can't okie doke. That's stuff that will get us in real trouble. So talk to them about how do we balance that, man? How, what is the real spirit of this in, in bringing um, happy media? You know, um... It, it, it's funny that you asked that, Commissioner uh, Robinson. You know, I got involved in this because of my HOA and the things that were happening and not happening. Mm. Uh, and one of them was an election. Mm. Uh, and they told us that, you know, they weren't going to have an election this year. We'll have one the following year. They were just going to appoint. The declarant was just going to appoint. Uh, so people to the committee um and so um that didn't sit well with me uh and so i drafted a lawsuit uh, and went down and filed it uh and as a result we wound up um having an election yes. um and moving our subdivision forward uh, in a way that made sense for us, the homeowners. We had, uh, when John Whelan was in charge, our declarant, they were paying about $5,000 a month to a law firm for collections. Well, we found out 2,000 of that 5,000 one month was to collect $80 from a lady that was in bankruptcy and no longer lived in the subdivision. <laughs> So they spent $2,000 of our money to try to collect $80 from a lady that was bankrupt and no longer lived there. No, thank you. We just wrote it off. We, we, we don't need to try to, we don't, within six months, Commissioner Robinson, we had saved $100,000 and put that into a reserve account. Mm -hmm. We cut out the management fees. We cut out the attorney's fees. There are only four or five bills that you pay. You pay the power bill, the water bill, maybe the gas bill. We put those on auto pay with Bank of America. So those bills were paid. It was, there was nothing. The management company, we hired a lawn. The guy that was doing the lawn, we hired him to go around and look at people's properties and take pictures with his phone and send it to us. And so we use him as our uh, enforcement mechanism for covenants. Um, and again, we were able to save $100,000, put it into a reserve account, uh, whereas before we had no reserves. And we were still able to maintain a $40,000 operating balance in our operating account. And so you are absolutely right. It's important you're working with other people's money. 
And it's important that you have, uh, that those people have your confidence. And the only way they can have your confidence is if you operate in an open and transparent fashion uh, with disclosure of the budget, um, disclosure of financials, uh, expenses, uh, and, and the rules. And, you know, one of the reasons we started the HOA Alliance, if you can do the next slide, uh, one of the reasons we started the HOA Alliance was because we went to uh, next door. And so we found a lot of the answers to our problems were on next door. And in fact, they were in the subdivision that was next door. And so we had questions. Uh, you can go to the next one, please. We had questions, but the questions, the answers to our questions were right next door. And so we said, hey, these developers and declarants and management companies are all talking and communicating with each other. But we as homeowners are not talking across community lines. And the answers to a lot of our questions are right next door in the subdivision down the street. Uh, and so, you know, we formed a nonprofit corporation to help homeowners help themselves because not only do you need the homeowners and the board, well, the board certainly needs to know the rules, but the homeowners need to know the rules. And the more that everyone is educated about the rules of these associations, um, the better off it is for everyone because you'll know that you're already in violation, so they won't have to come tell you that you're in violation, you know? Um, people's home, your home is typically the largest expense that a person has. It's their most treasured asset, right? And so people wind up either loving their HOA or hating their HOA, depending on the experience that they have while they're there. But our mission is to develop and strengthen Georgia neighborhood associations through education, programs, and advocacy. Uh, and so uh, you'll see up on the slide, you know, some of our objectives. You know, uh, we believe that there needs to be training. The United Way uh, offers a VIP training program for nonprofit boards, United Way VIP. It's like a 12 or 13 week program where they go in and tell you how to be a more board member. They train you on how to be a board member for a nonprofit organization. Uh, and so uh, we believe that that training is necessary uh, and, and it really should be mandatory because you have people coming into these positions that you know are volunteers and they're trying to do their best to can they, the best that they can, but they still got their their daytime job, they still got their family, their children, and other responsibilities. And so, uh, it is a way to help make sure that we have the most effective um, uh, leaders. You can go do the next slide. Um, community association documents. We talked about those uh, communities with covenants. Um, mandatory membership uh, is what is what we see with these HOAs, community associations, and and now the property owners association act. So what happened is, remember I told you earlier, there are HOAs. Yeah. Really, there's no HOA act in Georgia, no HOA law. Well, what they've done now is they've made a law called the Property Owners Association Act, the POA. And so, but the problem is, in order to become a POA, you have to have started after this legislation was passed. And your governing documents must specifically say that you are a property owners association, that you're governed by the Georgia Property Owners Association Act. And so the problem, Commissioner Robinson, is 90% of these HOAs were formed right. prior to the implementation of the POA Act. Right. And so what a lot of people have been doing now is trying to com convert them from HOA to POA. Now, if you are the association, then you would probably rather be a POA. It gives you a better ability to foreclose on the lien, uh, foreclose on the property. It gives you better opportunities to collect and enforce the rules of the association. If you are the individual homeowner, you might prefer to stay in HOA uh, and not give the association those uh, further rights and abilities on collection and enforcement. Uh, and so it depends on where you sit uh, at the table, but um, go to the next slide as well. 
No, no, no before, before you go for that, I got to stay there, though, because he, he brings up a good point. You know, again, uh, the, the rights of both sides, both sides of the equation, the homeowner versus the homeowner association. And I'm going back to me and you as commissioners. You got, sitting with, well, you got about 250,000 citizens in your district. I, yeah. I got 50,000. So he's five times bigger than I am. But I'm giving you context. You've got these homeowners. This is our biggest asset. Again, if you, I mean, I've been in the office for 13 years and I haven't gone through the education. There's no way I could do my job from a fiduciary responsibility. Like you, so we got people that you said that are volunteers, like, okay, I ain't got nothing else to do. We're gonna go up here, we're gonna be the, the, the officers of this HOA, but you got real power. I cannot take somebody's property, but if I don't like you, there's no regulation. It's like I, I don't, that's that's too much power without any education, without any regulation. And you get somebody in there that may be a lawyer, they got a little insight, and y'all are misusing that power. Y'all are overextending. I mean, we, we have boundaries, and y'all know we got the press. We got everything that the citizens, we as elected officials are, are we, we, we're contained. That's raw power. But you, you can take somebody's house, because I'm not paying my, I get the covenant, but I'm, I, I got to drive home this point. Like, I'll bet there's got to be some type of education and certification I, I still go back to. So I know you're promoting a law. You and I were working together up in, whatever happened to that? I, I have to yield to his, his we, leadership, but we, what we, happened We've got to go back. They sent it to a committee. Um, you know, we had the... Uh, because we pushed this last year. Last year, we put it through our, our local legislation. Yes. You know, Donzella James, Roger Bruce, all of them sort of pushed that on up. And it, it sort of, I, the pandemic hit. So that's what happened. So what, what happened? Yeah, they, they sent it to a committee. Uh, and then the pandemic hit. We've got to go back again. We got to go back in. We got to go back again and ask for, uh, it's the Georgia Community Association uh, Transparency and Uniformity Act, something to that effect. Basically, we're just asking for rules, but we've got to go back to the legislature and we need you guys to go with us because if we go by ourselves, they're not listening. But if we get all 2 million Georgia homeowners that live in community associations to make a voice at the legislature and ask for uniformity and transparency, yes. um, which which should be basic, right? It, it shouldn't seem... Seems like you shouldn't have to really ask for that. Right. I should but, have to sue you to, to give me records to your opening comments. I mean, and, and the other side is, you know, we have the workers' compensation law because we don't want employees suing employers. Right. We might need to look at a community association court because we really don't want neighbors suing neighbors right. over these rules. Right. right. We want people to work and live together happy, uh, happily. And, and, you know, these things tear associations apart. They tear people apart. Right. They tear families apart. Um, we're, and neighbors. we're neighbors. And we're neighbors. And, and all the while, the management company, the declarants, uh, and are, are oh. getting fat off of it. And the, and the lawyers and the law firms. Right, they they get paid off of, of off of the fight that we're fighting and the turmoil that you have to live in, and you have to go home and think about it every time you walk in the door. Well, you bring up a good point, and that's the issue that I'm hearing from my citizens. It's the fact that okay, I took five ten thousand dollars, I spent to try to fight something, and now I'm done. I ain't got no more money. Uh, you got to lean on my house. You can probably foreclose on me. And it was just because I had a misunderstanding. And so you, you have this heavy hand of these HOAs and there is, and it, there's misuse, I won't say abuse, but there's exploitation because they're not trained. They're not certified. They're not being held to a standard. And you got somebody who knows the game enough and they're manipulating. And I, I'm like, okay, there's gotta be a regulation. So I guess my question is, there's something that we can do at a local level. That's what we talked about our delegation. What if I require to certify these HOAs locally? Let's just put, you know, just like with neighborhood, that whatever it is, when you go out and evaluate people, how's your HOA doing? Right. And then we put some type of you get become a certified HOA. So people move out into your community. They know, are you good? I mean, there's got to be a way that we at a local level can, can reach this. Because we got guys, this is not right. Now, when it's working, it's working. Some communities are working well, but the ones that are not is the issue. But there needs to be a standard. So what else can be done by way of education on both sides, both the officers and their residents? What else needs to be done? So, you know, one of the things that we've done in Fulton County, we've adopted a transition ordinance. And so uh, which requires the declarant uh to turn over every well one it requires them to turn over the records 
Number two, it requires them to bring common areas, uh, common areas up to code uh, so that the homeowners aren't left. In my subdivision, uh, they were trying to leave us with a retention pond that hadn't been maintained in 15 years. Hmm. So we got 20, 30 trees that are 10, 20 feet high in a retention pond. And we went and got an, inv got an invoice for someone to clean it. It was going to be $120,000. Okay. So we, we called code enforcement on ourselves. We got cited. Yep. And we sent that citation to John Wheatland and said, we need you to pay for this. You've been responsible for this for the last 15 years, and now we've just been cited. So we need you to pay for the citation, and we need you to pay to remove all of this stuff out of our retention and detention plans. And we have four of them. So those, I'm going to think about the, the warranties that's associated with developing the actual community to begin with, and then it's turned over ultimately to be maintained and stuff. All that is some kind of way codified in this covenant or some type of, of, of document. But again, it's back to the, the, is there an appeal court? Where, where can I go to sort of fight this? Because I hear you say we can fight law. So what does that mean for the average person? It's again, not, you know, super lawyer. one of the things that we offer as HOA Alliance is dispute resolution. So if you find yourself as a nonprofit, if you find yourself in a dispute with your neighbor or your association, you can write to them and ask them if they would be willing to mediate the matter with the, through the HOA Alliance, right? But we need, and what I'm proposing, Commissioner Robinson, uh, is uh, I believe we need a, a court. I believe we need a HOA court, a community association court that is more akin to the workers' compensation court okay. that basically says, hey, we acknowledge that these people are working together and living together, and we don't want them at each other's throats. So we need to find a better way to help them resolve the issues right. that exist in these 10,000 plus community associations throughout the state of Georgia. So when he, when he brings up the point, think about it, 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 it's a civil matter. It's a civil matter, yes. It has nothing to do with the board of commissioners. It's a civil matter. It's simple, but the issue becomes you've got all these mini governments with these people with fiduciary responsibility amongst themselves. I mean, they enter into their own constitution, their own covenant on how they're going to manage themselves, but it's just um, there's no regulation, there's no consequences for misuse or anything like that. And people are already really getting the exchange that they're paying into. And that's all they really want. If this is what is required me to pay $200 a month or $500, and I get that, you know, when I came into the community, did you build my pool? I get my tennis courts. Did you? Where, where's the remaining? But I mean, some of this stuff is like, okay, you shouldn't have to go through this. Y'all know y'all are being okie doke. And the thing I try to bring light on, like, okay, don't do that. You know, don't, don't, don't mislead the, the public like that. And I'm talking to the citizens on both sides. Y'all know, you know, it's wrong. You know what you're doing. You, you can't look me in the eye and think I'm gonna bless that. It's wrong. You can't treat your your fellow neighbors like that in both ways. Your fellow residents, you gotta pay, do your part. And so it's, it's one of those being honest with ourselves and looking within, you know, Orrick Curry, who's now, I just appointed him to our planning zoning board. He was our keynote speaker and first HOA. He gets it. And you got to take responsibility and do right. But some of this is that you are going to have bad behavior. And so, again, so you talk about you're going to help with um, re resolution. So they contact the HOA Alliance. I mean, help them understand what that Contact is. the HOA Alliance, and uh, we can set you up with a mediator uh, that will help, you know, try to resolve your issue. Uh, the good thing about mediation is it is not, um, the mediator cannot make you do anything. He can only try to help the parties to resolve. Uh, and arbitration, the arbitrator can make a determination and the parties could be subject to that determination, okay? Uh, arbitrator ar operates more like a judge. A mediator is really more just a facilitator to try to help the parties facilitate uh, a settlement or a negotiation. Okay. Um, so yeah, we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we talked about what are covenants, where do you find them? There may be other rules and regulations. Uh, you may want to get a copy of your plat from the county. Uh, I've got one now, Commissioner Robinson, where the developer has started building houses in areas that were indicated on the plat as activity areas. Ooh. And so the plat is part of your contract 
with the association. And so we'll likely be asking that it's decorant uh, to come in. And, and what's happened, as you know, a lot of these, you know, we had the, after the collapse of 2008, a lot of these developers and decorants went bankrupt and disappeared. They're no longer there. Well, now the bank owns the property or some other body comes in, a new uh, builder comes in, a new developer comes in. So, uh, but you can get copies of your, your records, uh, your declaration. If you don't have a copy of your Declaration of Protective Covenants, your association should provide you a copy. If you can't get one from them, you should be able to get one from the county land records. Um, you can get the articles of incorporation from the Secretary of State. Uh, and you know your association may or may not charge you for duplicate copies. Next slide. Before you shift, I want to talk about developers. I know that's something that was brought up. Um, is we had a situation, you know, a common situation in my district where the um, the pool and the, and the clubhouse wasn't being built. There was a, a failure, as you said, because of the collapse of the Great Recession, and so you had new owners, or you know, they just repurposed themselves in another entity. And what the Board of Commissioners, we, we did, um, because we saw what was happening is that, well, you're still selling that you're going to have this pool uh, and this tennis course, but there's turtles and snakes down there. You never completed it. So, we're, so in our case, what we did is that um, the Board of Commissioners agreed we put a moratorium on that, that developer. And that means for the homeowners, there's not going to be any building out there, but for the most part, we're trying to get their attention. You can't exploit it. That's that for two years. All right. And so finally it came up, as you know, it came up out. I'm just telling the story. It came up out of that. And so now you have a new developer and they've got a new phase two and they're they're compliant. They, they agreed to build the pool and finish everything out. But here's the thing, we changed our local code that says, okay, for you developers, you got to build these amenities up front. No more 50%, no more at the end, because they're, they're, you're floating money based on things coming in. And so it's one of those we're trying. We're trying to use our power to sort of keep it honest, but again, it's still a civil matter. What are you experiencing regarding that? I mean, the fulfillment of amenities and stuff, because that's, that's usually it. Can I get my pool? Can I get the clubhouse? Can I get the tennis course? And are you keeping the main areas, the common areas done? And in exchange for that, um, I mean, how, how are y'all dealing with that? So, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's the same subdivision where the, the declarant had been in control right. since 2008, right? right. Uh, and still had not uh, built any amenities. But again, that's when we found out that the law, the case law, mm -hmm. states that the declaration as well as the plat and the other file documents are part of the contract yes. with the association, yeah. which means that that new builder yeah. who stepped in the shoes of the old builder mm -hmm. or that new declarant who stepped in the shoes of the old declarant is now responsible for the duties of the old declarant. Oh, and, so it which means it transfers those duties and responsibilities transfer and they are assigned to the new declarant, which means you have to build what is on that plat. You have to build that pool. You have to build uh, the, the clubhouse and whatever other amenities are on the stamp file plat. Uh, we talked about nonprofit corporations. Most community associations are Georgia nonprofit corporations. Next slide. Um, we talked about liability insurance. We talked about DNO insurance. Fidelity insurance, you also want to try to get that. If you are on a board, community association board, you want fidelity insurance. Fidelity insurance covers what happens um, if someone on your board misappropriates any funds. You, would, you need a fidelity policy in order to specifically be able to recover those funds. Um, you may need workers' compensation and you may also need flood insurance. Because again, if you're on the board, it's your responsibility, it's your fiduciary duty to protect the assets of the association. And what are the assets of the association? The common property, the common areas. Um, any detached structures or any attached structures, um, all right, next slide. Uh, more about insurance. You know, what happens if you don't have it? If some kid dies in the pool, right? Kid drowns in the pool, you don't have a, any insurance that's going to 
be um, some specific assessments uh, for you and every other homeowner in there. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you have insurance um, again, um, you know, in each individual homeowner, obviously you want insurance on your property. So if anything happens to your property, you can cover that. Next slide. Uh, meetings. All right. We talked about the bylaws earlier. What are the notice requirements? What are the quorum requirements? Commissioner Robinson talked about associations not having elections. Most of the paperwork, most of the documents, most of the documents for these community associations say that you must have a quorum to have an election, which means you have to have 25% typically uh, of the total community association vote. So if there are 250, well, let's just say to keep numbers straight, if there are 100 people, 100 homes in your subdivision, you've got to have at least 25 of those owners present at the meeting and or through proxy. You can use a proxy. You can have people present. You might have to go knocking on some doors. You might have to make some extra phone calls or emails, but you can reach that quorum. What we did, we stood outside and gave away um, Dunkin' Donuts and hot coffee to make sure that we got the numbers and the people that we needed to make sure that they couldn't say, well, we're not going to meet the quorum. No, we knew what we had 90 people vote. We walked in there with 60 votes. We walked into the meeting with 60 votes. So we knew what the outcome of the election was going to be. Um, but again, your bylaws will talk to you about quorum size, notice requirements, agenda meetings, minutes from the meetings, okay? Um, you need to make sure you have those, parliamentary procedure. Most association documents say that you follow Robert's Rules of Order. Um, talks about the methods for removal and replacement of a board member. If you have a board member, most documents say if you have a board member and that board member doesn't attend at least 50% of the meetings, the other directors can call for their removal. Now, if you as a homeowner want to get an entire board or an individual on a board removed, you have to have 25%. You, go, go, you have to go get a, um, not a survey, but a petition. petition. Do a petition. You need at least 25% of the owners to start the petition to, to call the meeting. You have to have 25% of the owners. But once that meeting is called, you then have to have 51% to actually get them removed. You got to have more than 50% to actually get them removed. Uh, and it also talks about methods for voting outside of a meeting, which is what we talked about just a moment ago, you can vote via proxy. Uh, if you got a neighbor that, you know, is gonna be at work on Saturday at 10 during the meeting, you go get that neighbor's proxy, you get them to sign and they get, either give you their vote or they can vote on their own. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so there are different types of meetings, right? There are annual meetings, which is a meeting of the owner, owners, all the homeowners in the association. But then there are also board meetings. And now everyone is not entitled to come to a board meeting. All homeowners are not entitled to be present at board meetings. Board meetings are just for the board members. The annual meeting is the meeting where all homeowners are entitled to be present. And uh, so you need to pay attention to which type of meeting is being held, which type of meeting is being advertised, okay? Uh, and make sure that you know the difference. Uh, annual meetings, there could be a special meeting notice. Uh, on a, again, as a homeowner, you can force the board to call a meeting. They haven't had a meeting, Commissioner Robertson, mm -hmm. in five years. Right. You go get that petition started, get your 25%, and you can force them to call a meeting. Um, quorum requirement, who counts towards a quorum? Do proxies count? Uh, if no quorum is obtained, and this is how they get away with that no election for five years, it's only 10 people coming to the meeting. We don't have a quorum. We have to vote at next year's annual meeting. And then what happens next year? 
only eight people show up. Right? And every not, usually what happens is until enough people get mad enough to show up, status quo will remain in place. So um no, no, don't leave that. Status quo will remain in place. So here's a question when you talk about quorum and proxies. This is key. A statistic. Um, and you guys know I share this often about home ownership, and that's important. You know, we know it's, we, we, it's stagnated a little bit because of the pandemic, and now it's picking back up. But for, because of the Great Recession right now, 43% of Douglas County homeowners are renters. This is important. The numbers don't lie. Right, so I'm, we're having this conversation, but I'm, at the same point, I know this backstory, like, okay, but 43% of the homes that are here, which is if I move to Cobb, to, you know, from Fulton over here, much cheaper place and so forth, but okay, so 43%, so how do we deal with those who want to act and um, participate in the HOA? Do I have to be a homeowner or can the renting work? How's the process? Talk to them about that, because that's, that's key, guys, because we're conversation, but I'm like, okay, but you even got the... Okay, yeah, so uh, another good point, Commissioner Robinson. So um, certainly uh, if you're on the board and if you're living in an HOA or community association, you want to treat everybody uh, fairly and treat everyone the same, whether they are a resident, an owner, uh, a resident or an owner, uh, and or I guess a visitor, right, uh, and or a tenant, right? Um, so you could be a resident and an owner, or you could be a resident and a tenant. Uh, typically, tenants do not get to vote uh, in an election, uh, but they do get to attend meetings. They do get to ask questions. They do get to express their opinions. Um, and the only way that they may be allowed to vote at an election is if the owner gives them a proxy, right? If you've got a great tenant, you might give them your proxy, you know? Um, so it is possible that they could vote at a meeting, but only if the owner of that unit authorizes them to meet. Now, the problem that we've been having now, Commissioner Robinson, and I'm sure you all have been dealing with this in Douglas as well, is that what we call the, the Airbnb effect. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have people in condominium associations uh, and, and, and it boils down to individual property rights versus community rights. Right. So you live in a community association, right. which means you are giving up some of your individual property rights for the greater good of the community. Yes. Uh, and so what happens is your home. Uh, most HOAs, I would say, I would say 100% of community associations, uh, maybe 99% of community associations, because there are a lot of different types, are for single family residential use, zoning, planning and zoning, you got it up here early, single family residential use. Now, if you march 50 different families in and out of your house throughout the year, is that single family residential use? I think not. That is more hotel, motel. And so one of the things I know City of Atlanta has done, they have now have a new uh, HOA condominium association registry or Airbnb registry so that you have to, if you're going to rent your home out, you have to register with the City of Atlanta, uh, make them aware of it, pay your application fee, of course. Of course. Um, and, but it gives them a chance to help awesome. regulate, monitor what is going on. But again, I, I would argue to you, and, and I have to look at their, theirs a little bit closer. I don't think that changes the zoning. And I think it's still, um, now maybe they allow an exception for the zoning law if you register through that process. Yeah. But uh, you again, the, the covenants, the Declaration of Protective Covenants restricts your use, restricts everyone's use on the property. And so when you signed on to buy in this community association, you signed on knowing that your use was going to be restricted to single family residential use. Uh, and so you may be violating if you are renting out uh, your, your home or your condo, you may be violating 
your declaration of protective covenants. Uh, and if your board finds out, uh, they may want to find you or stop you. And then so uh, be very mindful of that. But, okay, so you, you bring up a good point. I, I, want, I do want to leave this just about, um, so if I'm, I'm living there and uh, to be a voter, I have to be an owner. But what I heard you say is that nobody should be censored. I'm big on that. Yeah, and even the residents that live there could be could. I mean, you know, if you're renting, you can go, you can still vote. Well, let's go on. There are different types of voting and different types of elections. So within the HOA, you have to be an owner to vote. You can still vote for Commissioner Robinson if you're renting. Right. Right. Here, here. <laughs> no, but, 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 but again, it's those little small things that matter because sometimes uh, it's about the treatment of the actual resident or the tenant, as you say, right? And it's, it's you, you, sometimes you're not giving them the full, well, you don't have a real say, right? So there's, a, there's misuse. I mean, I'm hearing it out this little pockets and stuff like, okay, that's, that's not right. Now, again, that's not, I can't regulate that. So, so I try to do is educate this, let them know that no, you do have a voice. They do need to respond to you. Now, you may not can go call for an election because you're not an owner, but there's, there's, I mean, sometimes people just want to be heard. Like, you're not doing your part. Like, no, you know that's not right. And so you get silenced and censored, and that's unacceptable in America with that First Amendment now. So I, I, I try to bring balance to the conversation. So again, I just wanted to make that point. I want you to keep going. Yeah. But I want to drive home that point about, you know, they, they do get to speak, is your point. Yes, they do get to they, speak. They Everyone gets the opportunity to speak. We can do the next slide, and I'll try to go through these quickly. Yep. How much time do we have? We do have uh, some questions from our in-person okay. as well as Zoom. All right, perfect. Um, we can do the next slide. We talked about covenant enforcement. Let me just briefly say covenant enforcement versus code enforcement, okay? If someone is violating the covenants, you call the HOA or the management company. If they're violating the law, you call the police. <laughs> That's the difference between covenant enforcement and code enforcement. If it's a law, you call the police. If it's in your covenants, you call the management company or the HOA. Um, ooh, life cycle of a lawsuit. Uh, we don't even want to go there. Lawsuit is the last option. Lawsuit should always be your last option. It's expensive. Uh, one of these lawsuits could easily cost anywhere uh, from fifty to one hundred fifty thousand attorney's fees or more. Okay, uh, you always want a lawsuit to absolutely be your last option. Uh, you can try to mediate. Uh, mediation is always a great uh, and worthwhile objective, um, uh, and, and it is a process that helps you reach potentially a resolution. Um, and uh, you know, you can get an injunction. Or, Declaratory judgment, they can foreclose, you get attorney's fees, all of that good stuff. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just talking about more defenses uh, to coming up um, to, to a lawsuit. Uh, you see some of those are selective enforcement, the statute of limitations is run. Typically you only have uh, four years to collect on a uh, on a note, on a note that's monthly note, right? So if if your association doesn't collect your association fees for six years, and then in the year six they go back and say they want to go back to the first year, they technically are restricted to the only the last two years because they waived their right to those dues in those first four years. Next slide. Um, this just talks about other processes of the litigation process, the discovery process where both sides discover what the other, what there ever there is to discover about the other side's case. Um, motion, mediation, trial, judgment. Um, it's a long, tedious process. If you can avoid it, please do so. Next slide. collections um you know a lot of times this is about communication what we did 
we offer people 30 days and we waived all late fees and interest for 30 days. And we got a great response. So we were able to pick up collections on our own. And then at the end of that 30 days, guess what we did? We offered another 30 day extension. Just basically trying to give everybody a chance to come into compliance on their own without us having to go hire a lawyer and file suit and do all of that. So by the time we got to the end of 90 days, anybody that was left after that, and really all we wanted them to do was call us and work out a payment plan, right? You don't have to, thank you. You, you don't have to actually pay everything. Just call us and work out a plan. Tell us what your plan is to get it paid and we'll work it out. We tried to take the neighborly approach, Commissioner Robinson. Mm -hmm. um, and if not, then you got to get the management and the lawyers involved. Uh, and if, you, if you're not paying your association fees, then you're going to wind up paying for the association's attorney's fees. So you're going to wind up paying two, three times as much. Next slide. Uh, more about lawsuits and attorney involvement. This is just kind of the detailed breakdown, um, how the lawsuit works. After there's a lawsuit, you have to serve the other side. They get a chance to answer. Then there's discovery, likely a motion for summary judgment and or a motion to dismiss, mediation, trial, um, and possibly appeal. Right. Um, and so uh, you just have to be aware of all of that. You could sue and you might be right and you might win, but it might take you five years, one hundred fifty thousand dollars to do it. And if you suing over two thousand dollars, I would ask you, did you win? If it cost, if it cost you one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to win two thousand dollars, <laughs> did you win? I think you lost one hundred and forty eight thousand dollars. <laughs> Now you may have proved your point, <laughs> but that's an awful expensive point. Okay. Next slide. Um, more on how the lawsuit works. Um, you know, there are plenty of good lawyers out there, but uh, you know, it is it's, it's time intensive. It takes you away from making money and doing other things. Again, if you can avoid lawsuit, try to avoid it if you can. Obviously, if they're trying to foreclose on your house, you're gonna have to fight, fight, fight. But if you're paying your HOA dues up front, no matter what, nine, nine times a ten, it doesn't. They're gonna have the opportunity to, to, to foreclose on your home. Um, next slide. Transition. We talked about this. Commissioner Robinson asked about that. The transition from the declarant to the homeowners. You want to make sure that you get a. Um, a reserve study, you want to make sure that you know. Uh, we had one subdivision where the management company and the declarant had not been paying taxes on the clubhouse. And so somebody, an investor, bought the person the, the clubhouse. An investor that didn't live in the association bought the clubhouse on the courthouse steps through taxes. <laughs> if you are on the board, it's your responsibility to make sure those taxes get paid on all the property, on all the common area, and all the common properties. Uh, and in fact, you you stay on that board until there's a new election. You can move out of your subdivision and be gone for two years or five years. And if there's been no quorum and there's been no election and you haven't officially formally resigned, you're still on that board. So if you if you move, make sure you write a letter and resign from the board. Next slide. There also is a, a group called Community Associations Institute, CAI. It's a national organization. They have a local chapter. I believe their local website is cai-georgia.org. They have a lot of great resources and articles. Um, they have an article on best practices for transition. Uh, article on you know what to do as a new board. Uh, so a lot of great resources and articles there. Um, transition, who are the parties, the association, the manager, uh, and approving authority, which is typically the declarant. Um, there are transition agreements, um, a list of documents to be turned over uh, at transition. Uh, and in fact, the transition checklist a lot of the, some of those things we have on our website at Fulton County, uh, along with our transition ordinance. There's a checklist of everything that needs to be turned over. Uh, next slide, please.
uh, elections. We talked about this, um, the declaration, bylaws, and articles of incorporation. Um, typically, the um, the bylaws will talk about the number of board members, the eligibility of requirements for being a board member. Typically, you, you don't have, uh, you get typically each house or each lot gets one, one vote and one board or and or the possibility for one board member. So if you are a husband and a wife, you would not be able, each of you would not be able to be on the board because typically they want one of you representing that lot. Uh, nominations, how to nominate the term of office for a board member. Typically, you don't want all board members on the same term. You want to you want to retain some knowledge, uh, like they do here in Douglas and we do in Fulton. We have staggered uh, election times, so that there are some people that remain in office that know what the rules are and are already operate. Next slide, please. Um, an annual meeting is typically where you have your election. Um, now, here's the other thing that most people get confused about. There are there is the board of directors. And then there are officers. The officers are is the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Those are the officers or the officers. The board of directors, like the board of commissioners, dictates policy. And then the county manager, county administrator, and staff like the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer actually go and implement that. And what happens is people wind up wearing two or three hats at the same time and not knowing that they are wearing multiple hats. It's okay to wear multiple hats, but you need to know that you're wearing more than one hat at the same time. Um, again, notice of meetings, quorum, election, inspection of election, you and or your attorney could be present. You can ask to be present while the ballots are being counted, all of that good stuff. Uh, also now, this day and age, uh, many ways to do electronic voting uh, and to accept uh, you know, proxies via email and all that good stuff. Next slide, please. Uh, vacancies on the board are filled by the board, uh, elected by the members. If a board member leaves the board, I believe the board has the power to appoint a third member or a fourth member or a fifth member, um, but then there must be an election uh, as part of that annual election. Uh, proxy ballots, absentee ballots, um, election challenges, and even litigation over election. Um, you know, I've seen Commissioner Robinson, um, two boards operating at the same, two competing boards operating out of the same subdivision. Uh, one doesn't acknowledge or recognize the Renegade. other. Yeah, one doesn't acknowledge or recognize the other, uh, or they don't acknowledge or recognize each other or each, the board's authority. And when you have those situations, you know, really a court has to decide who is the actual governing board and who actually followed the right policies and procedures. Let's, let's do this real quick. I want to make sure we don't run out of time because we got a hard stop. I want to fill a couple of questions. Yes. Now. So, Wendy? Yes, I'm here. I, I have a question. Um, but in Duval, there's a lot of different types of voting that are uh, a resident and Marvin Arrington is my commissioner, but I'm building a house in Douglas County. So Commissioner <laughs> Robinson will be my, so this is perfect. So I get to meet both of you at the same time. Very good. But my question is where I'm moving, I'm building in Douglas County. Uh, there is no common area. There is, it is just a bunch of houses, a bunch of land with lots. But we have an HOA that has given me none of this information that you're telling me about now. And I am, I have, there are residents in the neighborhood that have been paying into the HOA since 2006. There's no records. There's the person doesn't live in the neighborhood anymore. And uh, I, I did my duty. I paid my HOA so I could fight my fight. But now I, I don't even know where to begin to ask this gentleman, where is this money? Is it run, is, is, is the PTA, is this run like a PTA? I'm a former PTA president. I know the ins and out of how that's supposed to go. Is there a governing body? I mean, I have tons of questions, but I have no idea where to start with an HOA that has no common area that has been collecting money uh, for years. So it is hard not to have a common area. Is there a sign at the front? No. 
There's no signage or anything at the front? No, no common area, no, no nothing. Well, you need one of my cards. Um, yeah. uh, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to have that, but, um, you know, it's possible, right? Um, I guess the, the other thing I would say is um, what we did in my subdivision, we couldn't beat them, so we joined them. We went and ran for office and took over. I tried to do that too. Uh, and so once once you get on the board, then you have unfettered access to any and all documents that you can find. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, uh, it is is there's a rabbit hole now. There is a specific way, um, specific procedure, statute that you have to follow that you can ask for information and records but you need to do it pursuant to that statute. You have to specifically ask for the records. You have to give them the reason that you're asking for the records. Um, and there are two or three other requirements that you have to meet uh, when you do that. So, um, you know, you wanna make sure that you are asking the right questions in the right format. And if you ask the right questions in the right format, they should be able to give you an answer. However, if the previous board didn't give them any answers, it's hard for them to produce something to you that they never got the answer to themselves. All right, we have another one from uh, Mr. Curry back here. Yes, um, Ori Curry, uh, Village of Brookmont, HOA president. Um, I actually attended your uh, Zoom. You had the Alliance on Zoom. So I, it was very helpful in us redeveloping what was already there, but we had to tweak it. And I think that is very important, even to the point about elections, because the biggest thing that we found out is we do elections, but we don't get no candidates. And then at that point, what do you do when you don't get no candidates and you want to step down, but you know, there is nobody else to step up. Mm -hmm. How does that play? You know, I know, it, you know, we talk about being a part of the HOA, but taking on that responsibility of being a board member. And also, we also have committee chairs who sits in different positions like social committee, communication, and things of that nature that we're finding out now that we're not getting the people who want to be on the board versus the people who already been there for a while. So that means you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. That means you're doing such a good job, they don't want you gone. Mm -hmm. uh, which is better than the alternative <laughs> of them beating down the door to get you out, okay? Um, what I would suggest, um, a lot of people will do uh, president-elect and vice president-elect, all right? And so what you can do is be training someone make the terms only last for a year and hey, or two years, right? Uh, because again, there's a difference between being on the board and being an officer, right? Um, and so we have to keep that in mind. You keep that in mind, um, that will help you uh, manage it because really you almost don't even need president, vice president. You might just get like a, you know, a manager. Typically that's what associations do. They have to hire the manager to, to do the day-to-day -day operations. Right, and the board just sets the policy. We, we do have a policy that manages the, manages the everyday piece of it. But if anything goes that when they do what they're doing, and they come back and somebody said that I feel like I was, uh, I got a violation that I shouldn't. So it has to be the board to overturn that and say, okay, we looked at your case, and we're going to go ahead, and we're going to, we're not going to find you. Or yes, you were, but we only know the charge this much fine. So we have that piece, but it's just the idea of it. You know, we put it out there saying we have these positions that are available, but we don't get people to fill them. And we don't have to, you know, nobody wants to step up to the plate, even though we have a property management company that's management. It's just it, it's really succession planning and, and giving people options. I don't know if there are any special perks that you could offer your board members, you know, in my community, I think we used to get one or two free rentals of the clubhouse if you were serving as an officer. And so sometimes that's enough to help people, uh, inspire people or motivate people to actually come join the board. But again, if you can do 
president elect, vice president elect. I mean, it's, it's hard enough getting four people. You can't, <laughs> now you're trying to get eight, but uh, if, if there's a way to, you know, set people up so that they automatically roll over into different positions, that may also be an option for you. We've got a question from, uh, yes, uh, they were, they're asking, what are pandemic exceptions for HOA payments? Are there any? Yeah, unfortunately, no. Uh, unfortunately, there have not been. And, you know, even from the federal government standpoint, there has been money for rental assistance, right? Her Commissioner Robinson said earlier, 43% of people in Douglas County are renting. In Fulton County, we're at 48% and we're 52% homeowners. And I said, well, wait a minute, we got $30 million for rental assistance. How much did we get for mortgage assistance? How are we going to help people stay in there? We need to help people stay in their house, but we don't need to just help renters stay in their house. We need to help homeowners stay in their house as well. So if we've got 30 million for rental assistance, we need to, we got it Fulton County, we got $200 million in addition to the 30 million for rental assistance. So I said, hey, I need another 30 million for homeowner assistance for mortgage assistance. But then that just pays your mortgage. That doesn't do anything for your condo, right? For your, 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 your condo fees or your HOA fees. So you've got to, you know, try to work with the board, or ask the board. I mean, most boards will work out some type of payment plan with you, right? Most boards, if you pay something, see, see here's what happens. People stop paying and then they stop paying for a year. Then it turns into two years. And then it turns into five years. But if you, hey, if you hit hard times, but you send them $20 a month, $50 a month, they're gonna see the pattern. They're gonna see that you're trying and more than likely they'll try to work something out with you. The good thing, um, you know, again, but again, what, 30 million for rental assistance alone? That, that's that's our whole COVID money. Uh, it's just, <laughs> geez, um, I, but I appreciate the magnitude. Let's keep going. We want to give a few more questions in before we get to the end. Please. Yes, got another one down here. Yes. Uh, Daryl Bumpus. Uh, I'm the president of uh, HOA. Um, well, I just want to piggyback on uh, what Mr. Curry had stated about the uh, if no one wants to be on the board. Uh, even if you offer the incentives and no one, the, the, the board members serve their term and just no one, even with incentives included, wants to be on the board, what happens in that scenario? Well, it's no, no board any, any longer now because everyone, the, the, the previous board has stepped away. Let me, let me try to frame this. So for example, um, I think my, my mother um, and um, had a house and it was for the first original homeowners and so it, she aged out right in other words um, but what happens to HOA at some point to your point nobody wanted to participate and they dissolved it to a uh, different community um, but at the same point I guess I, I, I posture says well what happens if it does dissolve in other words nobody does anything it collapses by intent um, voluntary or involuntary what are the impacts of that because again if, if there's nobody running the government if nobody's running it what happens well, you have to have someone there. And that's what I told you before. It, unless those people formally submitted resignation letters, if they just walked away, they're still technically on that board. Uh, and that's why companies are set up like that. Companies are set up. There always has to be a board. There always has to be someone there to operate. And if not, then there's a procedure by which you can uh, remove the covenants uh, or dissolve. Uh, the Declaration of Protective Covenants. So the only person that it would be um, uh, just the problem management company then, I guess, right? No, because the, who, who hires them? <laughs> only the board, the, only a board could hire them. So, but, but you're right, right? This is what happens. Board hires a property management company, then the board goes away. Property management company, they want to keep getting their money. So they still stay on that contract. They still getting their money until you all as homeowners come in and say, hey, no, wait, you can't do this. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't mind if somebody has their trash can out next to their house in this subdivision. We're, we're okay with that as long as it's not trash all over the place, right? Uh, and, and, and they may be fining people $100 for that. 
or more, right? And so your homeowners get mad, but the management company works for the association and you as owners can, or the board can hire or fire the management company at any time uh, and or restrict their services, right? I mean, there may just be, you may not need them to do everything. If they offer 10 services, you may only need them to do one or two of those services. You might not be able to afford for them to do all 10 services that they want to do. Thank you for that. One more question. Uh, in a uh, scenario that you may have a, 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 a homeowner that's in the rears uh, with their dues, and you're going through the procedure, the process, the legal process of, of, of trying to collect, um, and they're still not, you're sending out these letters and they're still not responding. Uh, what is your suggestion? Do, do you be a neighborly board member and knock on the door and say, listen, we don't want to, no one wants to take you home. No one wants that, that type of um, uh, situation in their community. Um, what would you suggest? Would you knock on that door and say, listen, we, you know, we, we're sending you the letters. We don't want to see you go down this road. You definitely want to take the neighborly approach. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to knock on that door. <laughs> uh, you, you, you want to be real. I mean, because you may intend that to be neighborly and someone may interpret it right. as not being neighborly. I can't believe you came to my house with that. Okay. So, you know, it's, there's a thin line, right? Um, but what we did was try to give everybody every opportunity um, to, to pay or work out a payment plan. Uh, and, you know, after, after affording everybody every opportunity to pay or work out a payment plan, you know, there's some people you just got to throw your hands up on, right? Um, but by the time you've done that, it's been, it's reduced tremendously. And so you're at a, you know, instead of you trying to sue 50 people, you might only be suing five, right? And that's a lot more manageable. But I don't even know how you can sue if you don't have a board. I don't know how you can do it because the management company's got to ask permission to sue. And the, the lawyer, like who's, you, you know, um, there's, there, somebody's calling some shots. Uh, and if it's not the homeowners, it should be the declarant, but I just, I wouldn't let the management company and or the attorneys roam free. Yeah, well, that was an example. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was just piggybacking on what Mr. Curry was saying. And, uh, you know, we have a board in place, but uh, my concern was if you have that, that, that resident that's not paying. So, like you said, don't have that direct contact. Just let the uh, legal process take its course. Yes, uh, yes, direct contact. I mean, you know, if it's someone you know or have a relationship with, that may work. But if not, I would. Uh, notice mail yeah notice mail email yeah. all right any other questions well i think we do have well we're right at noon and i know you want to keep yes. everybody's time in, yes into consideration I, I do we've been at it for, um, for about four hours now and so um, Commissioner Arrington, I want to thank you so much, sir, for being here and, and sort of facilitating this. His information will be available for you. Is that information that you shared earlier available somewhere? Uh, yes, it is available uh, at our, on our website, hoaalliance.org, hoaalliance.org. We also have a, a Georgia website, which is Georgia, hoaalliance.org. Um, you can go to either of those sites and information is available. Uh, you can also go to our HOA Alliance on YouTube, and we got the last uh, three or four years of Douglas County boot camps and mm -hmm. Cobb County, uh, Fulton, and our Georgia boot camp as well. Uh, and we'll have our Georgia boot camp coming up uh, in November of this year. So we certainly want to invite you out. You typically every year after we go out to all the counties, we bring everybody together all under one roof to talk about. Uh, our future and how we can work together towards 
maybe getting some of this legislation passed for next year. Absolutely. So to that point, Wendy, for anybody that's online, um, as is our custom, Commissioner Arrington, we will respond to their questions okay. uh, accordingly offline. So we'll make sure we capture those that are um, online. And for any of our studio audience, thank you so much. We can talk after this. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we're going to bring this to a close. I'm going to thank everybody for uh, attending the fifth annual HOA boot camp. Again, my name is Kelly Robinson. What a great day. We had community policing. We had HOA education. Again, at the end of the day, you have to do your part. We're doing our part. So we want to make it a better place to live, work, and play. My name is Kelly Robinson. I'm going to sign off. Thank you, and good afternoon. Yeah, Any questions you guys have for him remaining? I just, as we break, we're, we're good. I know it's been a long day. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for you. I'm Karen Thompson, for the Karen Thompson, HR President of Terminal. For when you want to